All right, EM Hotep family. We're, you're tuning into, of course, the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. And we're going to do something that I'm, I, I named it, I renamed it from the last one I named it, which is this, is this is actually the blueprint for white colonialism. Okay, this is the blueprint for white colonialism. And so we have to try to figure out what can we learn from this, you know? Because essentially the people who colonized our continent were studying certain materials, and this is one of them. All right? So we're going to engage the prince by Machiavelli, and we're going to figure out what we can learn from it. I am your host, Onitase Kumat, uh, founder, of course, of the African Blood Siblings, and the author of the Book of Power, as well as the Pro-Black Compendium, and of course, Zubiri. Uh, if you haven't already, you probably could check out the worship, the weekly worships we have. Otherwise, you know, understand that I'm also going to, we're going to start off this organization for 2021, which is Kerua Uncobia, and I would like for you to be a part of that. But without further ado, let's just jump in to the literature and get to part two, you know, which is uh, other aspects of political power. So it starts with chapter 12, which is the different kinds of armies, and of course, one of them being mercenaries. Uh, also, you see with the word auxiliaries, that's um, from uh, Plato. So Plato is another one of those white boys that you might want to study. Uh, well, not want to study, but, you know, a lot of white folks study. All right. So let's go. Now that I have given a detailed account of the different types of the, of the kinds of principalities that I set out to discuss, have paid some attention to the cause of their flourishing or failing and have showed the methods by which many men have tried to acquire them and retain them. I turn to a lesser detailed account of how each kind of principality can be attacked and defended. I have spoken of how necessary it is for a prince to have firm foundations for his power, otherwise he will go to ruin. The chief foundations for all states, new states as well as old or composite ones, are good laws and good armies. Look at that right here. The chief foundation for all states are good laws and good armies because a poorly armed state can't have good laws and a well-armed state will have good laws and a well-armed state will have good arms i can set the laws aside and address myself to the armies all right uh, the army with which a prince defends his state will be either so this is this is what i mean we really have to like this is right here you know i, I know brother let's see if we could do what, what koku does which is if we could just highlight stuff you know, uh, so down at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, at the Bit of Medicine podcast, bro reads through stuff and he highlights them, you know, and I'm thinking that I'm going to do that too, right? Might as well. I mean, the button's right there, right? But look at that. The chief foundation for all states, new states as well as old, right, are good laws and good armies. The thing with this is that when you're talking about real nation building, you should be talking about laws... The laws and the armies. And here's the thing. Here's the thing that I want you to focus on. The reality being that when you're in another man's country and you're talking about uh, laws and so on, right, you can't enforce them because you don't even have like, any armies. You can't enforce, you know, like, like, like you look at the 10-point program of the BPP, Right. The 10-point program of the BPP is like, hey, we want full employment. We want this, we want that. Can you do any of that stuff? You understand? You asking another nation to do this stuff. Meanwhile, you don't even have a military force. Now, of course, you know, the BPP did form uh, the Black Liberation Army, I think. Yeah, BLA. So so they technically were. And, and if you look back at the literature, you look back on the reflections of the Black Panther Party, they were saying we should have had two separate organizations. We shouldn't have been that you were part of the BLA and the BPP. You know, you shouldn't be part of the political party, the good laws and the good army uh, in the same country. Because then when they took out the people, because the, the people in the party were operating in plain sight. You understand? So if the army, so, if the, so basically if, if the people in the party and the people in the army are the, two, are the same people. And you're looking for the army, right? But the party <laughs> isn't hiding. You know, the army is a guerrilla warfare tactic, right? It's a guerrilla warfare. So the army got to be hiding, okay? If you're doing guerrilla warfare, you can't just... But they were the same people. Now, now check this. Now, 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 of course, when you pick up the Book of Power, you're going to see the Mau Mau. Mau Mau had the same thing. They had the political party, 
and they had the army, right? They had the guerrilla warriors, the insurgency, and they had the political party. And the political party was operating in plain sight because they weren't the same people. And even when you go to uh, Nkrumah's handbook on revolutionary warfare, he was breaking down for you how you have the political party on one hand and you have the army on the other hand. And they're two separate entities. They're two different, they're two distinct forms. You see? But chief, chief among it is, again, you have to have both. Right? And of course they're separate. Because, and look, look at this right here, he says, a poorly armed state can't have a good law. So even if, the, even if you have a political party, and you see how I make it pan-African. Y'all thought I was just talking about America, but no, nah, I was making it pan-African. I was talking about the Krumah, and I was talking about Kenya, Ghana, and the United States. All right? But the point is this, that you can't say you have good laws if you don't have good arms. You understand? If you don't have, and, and the thing is that, I mean, I understand that you could be like, oh, well, we want to establish this. You know? That's fine. You can want to establish it. All right? You can want to. But but you have to go about with what's practical. And this is why I, I'm telling you right now, that's what we, we, we're about. We have to be about good laws. But let's keep going. All right? Uh, the army with which a prince defends a state will be either his own or mercenaries or auxiliaries that soldiers belonging to and commanded by some other prince or some mixture of the above. All right? So mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous, and any ruler who relies on them to defend his state will be insecure and in peril because they are disunited, ambitious, undisciplined, and disloyal, courageous when they are with their friends, cowardly in the presence of the enemy. Uh, they have no fear of, you know, white people talk about this, so gee, and don't keep their promises. Although he doesn't say so, Machiavelli is now talking only about mercenaries. Auxiliary armies will be the topic in the next chapter. So he's saying mercenaries are usually cowards uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and I mean, it's very important for you to realize, too, that he's coming. He's actually in Italy. OK, he's in Italy. Right. Uh, Italy is near Spain and Portugal. Right. I'm just thinking. Right. Uh, Spain and Portugal had the Moors. OK, the Moors were uh Con like conquered Spain and Portugal it was called El, El Andalus. All right. The thing that m made them fail in the end was that they had a large mercenary army. Okay. The thing that made them fail in the end was that they had a large mercenary army. Pay attention. All right. And, and peace to the chat. I see one viewer, but that's all. It's all good. All love. Thanks for being here. All right. With them as his army, the only way a prince can hold off his own ruin is by holding off any military attack. In peace, one is robbed by them, and in war, by the enemy. Okay, so, yeah, so in peace, one is robbed by uh, mercenaries, and in war, he's robbed by the enemy. Why? Because they have no affection for you, and no reason to go to battle except the small wages you pay them. And those aren't enough to make them willing to die for you. They're ready enough to be your soldiers while you aren't at war with anyone. But when war comes, they either desert or run away on the battlefield. It shouldn't be hard to convince the reader of this because Italy's downfall has been caused purely by the long period of reliance on mercenaries. For a while they looked good and actually won some battles against other mercenaries. But when the foreign armies uh, showed up, the mercenaries were revealed in their true colors. That's how it was possible for Charles the F Eighth of France to seize Italy with chalk in hand. The phrase is a joke by Pope Alexander VI suggesting that the French didn't need to fight and only had to go through the towns putting a chalk mark on each house they wanted as a billet for soldiers. Oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> they just said, oh, we, we go, uh, I, well, I don't know what a billet is, but, you know, from context clues, I'm going to guess that they're, they're, they're saying that's where they wanted to sleep. You know, I'm going I'm to look up uh, billet. Quickly. So a billet is a living quarter to which a soldier is assigned to sleep. Yeah, okay, boom. I'm, yeah, I'm shit. My kind of school is on point. But yeah, so basically the, the French didn't even fight. They were just like, oh, uh, we're going we gonna to camp here. We're going to camp here. We're going to camp And the mercenaries were like, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> but I mean, that, that's facts. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the thing. That's facts. This is what I'm saying. Like, like, like when we're talking about nationalism, and this is, this is the reality about nationalism. This is the reality about nation building. If you're talking about going to war with these Ascani, all right? You talking about bringing soldiers in, right? And then you also have to ask yourself, well, do we have access to mercenaries? Or do we or do we have people that are willing to get down and fight? You know what I mean? Cuz you hearing me right now, you know and look, there's only there's only two people right now hearing me. But if you hearing me right now, 
you got to ask yourself, are you willing to fight for the, for the cause of, of, of African liberation? Because a lot of people aren't. You know, that's, 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 that's a sad fact. So you got these Ascari and they're going to be doing what they're doing because they don't want that. Like nobody. So nobody wants to fight them. But this is why you have to have these good laws and the mentality of good laws in place. OK, that's something that we're going to have to do. All right. Because otherwise, you know, nothing's going to be done. So Savonarola told us that our sins were the cause of Italy's trouble. And he was right. But the trouble comes not from the sins he was thinking of, but from the ones I have described. They were the sins of princes, and it is fitting that the princes have also suffered the penalty. I want to show more clearly how unsatisfactory mercenary armies are. If a given mercenary commander is virtuoso, right, then you can't trust him because he'll be busy pursuing power for himself, either by turning against you, his employer, or by attacking people whom you don't want to be attacked. And if he isn't virtuoso, his incompetence will work against you in the usual way. Someone might object. What have you said about mercenary commanders holds for anyone with soldiers under his command, whether mercenary or not, right? So it makes sense. Right? So the implication of this is that it doesn't matter what kind of soldier a state army has. I reply that it matters greatly and that when armed forces to be used by a prince, then the prince ought to go in person and put himself in command of the army. And this is something that's really important right here. You, you have to notice, I mean, this is something that you really got to, I want you to really grasp. Okay? Every nation has a war. Like, like when, when you look at the, the way how they describe Africa, right? They say, oh, you, you know, black people have chiefs. You know, they're chiefs. But then you realize, when you look at the Constitution of, let's say, the United States, right? It says the commander-in-chief. And the commander-in-chief is the person who's in charge of the, mil the armed forces, right? And when you look at the, the chieftaincy that they accused us of having in Africa, they were war chiefs. And they were trying to remove and replace the war chiefs. The, pre the people who the armed forces, who led the armed forces in the battle. The command of the armed forces in battle. Don't, when you say that they took over the chiefs, that's exactly what they mean. That's what exactly what they mean. They took away. They took over the war chiefs, the people in charge of war. And when they did that, that's when the people lost. You understand? Like people need that leadership. And then you have to ask yourself: Are you going to put yourself in that position to be that leadership, or to or are you going to put yourself in that position to be behind that leadership? You know, that's one of the most important things that you have to you have to grasp. To be honest. Okay? That's one of the most important things that you have to grasp, the idea that, realistically speaking, we as an African people have always organized under the pretext or the pretense of going to war. And if, and if our war organizations are being torn apart and torn away from us, then we have to reorganize that. Okay? Let me continue. And when a republic goes to war, it has to send its citizens as commanders... When one is sent who doesn't turn out satisfactorily, he should be recalled. And when a commander turns out to be very capable, there should be laws that forbid him to exceed his assigned authority. Experience has shown princes and republics with their own armies doing extremely well, and mercenaries doing nothing but harm. And it is harder for a citizen to seize control of a republic that has its own army than to, this, than to do this with a republic that relies on foreign troops. Examples... Of the advantage of republics having its own armies, Rome and Sparta stood for many ages armed and independent. The Swiss today are completely armed and entirely independent. Examples of the troubles republics get into when they rely on mercenaries. In ancient times, the Carthaginians, Carthaginians were attacked by their mercenary soldiers after the first war with the Romans, although the mercenaries were commanded by Carthaginian citizens. And this is something that you, you probably don't really get. So, th again, they're not studying... They're not studying the ancient past because they figured that they're a bunch of white folk. They're studying the ancient past because there are lessons there. You know? So he's like, Rome and Sparta were powerful because they had their own armies. Now, the Carthaginians, and this is something that you actually pick up when you read Hannibal, is that he did get a bunch of mercenaries. He did get a bunch of mercenaries. And, and all, all, all Machiavelli is doing is telling you is that, oh, those same mercenaries attacked him. The Thebans, now, if you don't know who the Thebans are, that, those are the ancient Kemet too. All right. After the death of their general, uh, Epimenides gave Philip of Macedon the command of their army, and after victory, he took away their liberty. Right now, now this is actually uh, now, now. Of course, the Thebans. This might be a little bit later in the in the uh, time frame. Right. This might be a little later in the time frame. But but it's 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 important to realize uh, that that it's something that happened. 
right? Now let's keep going. Uh, when Duke Filippo died, the Milanese engaged Francesco Sforza uh, to lead their troops against the Venetians. He defeated the Venetians at Caravaggio and then allied himself with them to crush his employers, the Milanese. His father, having been engaged as an army commander by Queen Johanna of Naples, left her unprotected so that to save her kingdom, she had to appeal to the king of Aragon for help. It may be objected. Uh, there are striking counterexamples to your thesis about the danger of hiring mercenaries. The Venetians and the Florentines extended their dominion by the use of mercenaries, and their commanders didn't make themselves princes but defended their employers, right? He's like, I replied that, and this is what I'm saying. He says, look, there are examples. Because the thing is that you can you can have a thesis. You can have an idea, and then it's it's bigger than that. You know what I mean? It's, it's all everything's gonna be bigger than your idea, right? Notwithstanding, he says, "Look, I replied to that matter that Florentines were favored by chance. Of the virtue, all see uh, commanders who might have been threats. Some weren't victorious. Some met with opposition, and others turned the ambition elsewhere. That is what the text says. But Machiavelli's only example concerns mercenaries who met with opposition and therefore redirected their ambition." One who wasn't victorious was John Hawkwood, and since he didn't conquer, his loyalty couldn't be proved. But everyone will agree that if he had conquered, the Florentines would have been at his mercy. Sforza had Bracchio's people always against him, but the two mercenary leaders kept one another in check. Sforza turned his ambition to Lombardy. Bracchio went against the church and the kingdom of Naples. But let us look at what happens quite recently. The Florentines appointed as their army commander, Paolo Vitelli, an extremely shrewd man who, from being an ordinary citizen, had risen to great prominence. There's no denying that if this man had captured Pisa on their behalf, the Florentines would have had to retain his service because if their enemies hired him as a commander, they, the Florentines, would be lost. And if they did keep him, they would have had to obey him, i.e. there would be nothing to stop him from installing himself as their prince. And see, this is the thing that you, like, you, like, I want you to understand what he's saying. Right? I want you to understand what he's saying because this is something that we have to understand as a people. All right? Uh, mercenaries. What is a mercenary? A mercenary is a foreigner, right, who is, who's, who's, who's fighting your battles. Okay? Now, if a foreigner is fighting your battles, if, now, here's the thing. If a foreigner captures a land, right, and you say, okay, here's your little paycheck, here's your little wages, right? You understand? If they're fighting on a, a, a big-ass battle, okay? For, for 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 a police salary, you understand? It, 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 they're not gonna sit with it, okay? They're not gonna sit with it. They they want more because you don't had a whole you just you just got a whole asset. You just got a whole new territory. You understand? So 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 they want more for that. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Now, as for the Venetians, right, I hope you thought about it. As for the Venetians, if we look at their achievements, we see that they fought confidently and gloriously so long as they made war using their own men with nobles and armed commoners fighting valiantly. That was in sea battles. When they began to fight on land, they forsook their virtue and followed the Italian custom of hiring mercenaries. In the early stages of their expansion of land, they had little to fear from their mercenary commanders because they didn't have much territory for the commanders to eye greedily and because of their great reputation, which was which will have scared off any mercenary who wanted to go against them. But when their domain expanded, as it did under Ka Carmen Nula, right, they got a taste of the trouble that mercenaries can bring. They saw what a virtuoso soldier he was. They beat the Duke of Milan under his leadership. But they also saw that he was uh, becoming lukewarm against the war against Milan. They were afraid that he would bring them any more victories uh, because he was no longer victory-minded. So they, they, they were afraid, and were afraid that he wouldn't bring them any more victories. Yeah, because he was no longer victory minded. So they didn't want to pay, keep him on their payroll, but they wouldn't, couldn't just dismiss him because they would threaten them, because that would threaten them with the loss of all the territories they had gained. The threat coming from an enemy whose army was commanded by the able Carmen Gula, Carmen Gula, whatever, to keep themselves safe. Therefore. Their only option was to kill him. They recalled him to Venice for consolation, for consultations, then accused him of treason and tried and beheaded him. After him, they had several mercenary commanders, Machinelli names three of them, who didn't create a fear of their winning victories. 
uh, and then getting out of hand because they usually lost, as happened at the Battle of Alia, where in one battle they lost everything they had acquired through eight centuries of effort. The use of mercenaries brings a widely spaced series of slow minor victories and a rapid rattle of large defeats. These examples concern Italy, which have been ruled for many years by mercenaries, and I want to discuss more fully the problem that they raise, because a grasp of its origins and its growth will contribute to finding a solution. So what this means, and I want you to, I want you to really get this. What this means is that you have to, like, if you don't like mercenaries, like, you're not supposed to like mercenaries. Like, mercenaries basically means that you have this new nation, right? And the people inside of the military are a bunch of foreigners, right? As opposed to homegrown. Right, homegrown warriors, and that's the thing that we're not doing. You know, other countries—not I won't say other countries, but some, but a lot of countries require their men to have military service. Okay, like even, even like, like even Haiti. I'll say Haiti. You know, it, it, it required every man to have military service. You know, and I look at my son, and I'm like, you know, I can't wait for this boy to 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 to, to get into military service for the Pan African cause. Right, it's it's a dangerous game. You know? And I mean, what Dessaline said was, he was like, okay, look, I don't mind if my son, you know, he's the emperor. And he's like, I don't mind if my son, just make him start off as like a captain or something. You know, he don't need to get, like every other kid got to go through the, the, you know, like from infantry upward. But let my boy start off as a captain. Now, that's all I would say too. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like obviously not everybody needs to start off as an infantry. You know, because sometimes if, 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 in particular if they can distinguish themselves. And particularly because, you know, he's going to have access to me anyway. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like let's face it. You know? Uh, you know, having access to, to, uh, to, to certain people is, is a good thing, too. You know? Uh, so, I mean, but even so, it's like, you know, I, it's, not my, it's not my call. You know what I mean? It's the call of, of the future Africans who would say, you know what? Look, Oni. You want your son to be infantry. We don't care. We don't care if he got access to you. And that's fine. You understand? Because if we are in a position where we can say that, that means that all the work that we're doing today is worth it. You know? And, and hopefully y'all just send my son to some good battles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> some winning battles. You know what I mean? Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, you know, but yeah, you know, uh, a beautiful little kid, you know, and, and, and you know, like that's that's what we're gonna need. All right. So anyway, so the essential background facts are that in recent times the empire has been uh, repudiated in Italy. The Pope has acquired more temporal power. Wait, did I read this part? Uh, their examples concern Italy, which have been ruled for many years by mercenaries, and I want to discuss more fully the power that they raised because the grasp of its origin and its growth will contribute to finding a solution. Okay. So he continues the essential. Background facts are that in recent times the empire has been repudiated in Italy. The Pope has acquired more temporal power and Italy has been divided up into more states. Many of the great cities took up arms against their nobles who had ruled oppressively with the emperor's support. The churches sided with the rebels as a way of increasing his temporal power. And in many other towns, private citizens became princes. The upshot of this war was that Italy fell partly into the hands of the church and of republics. The church consisted of priests and the republic of civilians, and both started to hire foreigners to do their fighting. The first successful mercenary commander was Alberigio de Cano Ramagna. It was through learning from him that Braccio and Forvor and others were in the times the arbiters of Italy. Uh, after these came all the other mercenary commanders down to the present time, and the result of all their virtue has been that Italy has been overrun by Charles robbed by Louis, ravaged by Ferdinand, and insulted by the Swiss. A fundamental fact about the mercenary commanders Machiavelli goes on to explain is that the armies contain far more cavalry than infantry, sometimes a ratio of 10 to 1. Wow, okay. The reason was that each soldier had to be paid and fed, so there was a reason to keep the sheer number of soldiers down. Uh, more territory can be controlled and more respect gained with a given number of cavalry than with the same number of infantry. Therefore, etc., he continues... The mercenary commanders also did everything they could to lessen fatigue and danger to themselves and their soldiers. In battle, they didn't kill, but merely took prisoners whom they, who they then freed without even demanding ransom. When a mercenary force was besieging a town defended by another mercenary force, Machiavelli says neither side was willing to attack at night. 
The besiegers didn't protect their encampments with stockades and ditches, and mercenary armies didn't campaign in winter, he continues. All these things were permitted by their, their military rules, which they devised, as I've said, to enable them to escape danger and hard work. And so they had brought Italy to slavery and humiliation. So uh, this is actually pretty interesting. So basically, you know, kind of like the, 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 the war game, like, you know, how people read, uh, they read, uh, what was it, uh, Chance of Williams, Destruction of Black Civilization. And they say, black folk, when we used to go to war, we ain't never killed nobody. Right. And it's like, that's not even true. One, two, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, you're looking at particular examples, you know, because again, like, like the brother was like, another brother was showing, he showed a thread of how, you know, let's say the Akan, who a lot of us, you know, we give props to, apparently they were like bloodthirsty, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like they were bloodthirsty, like they was whatever, you know, of course you had the Zulu, they were bloodthirsty, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of people were just like downright bloodthirsty, downright killing. So the idea that people weren't killing, they just took it as sport, isn't the case. But you see, this is what the mercenaries were doing, even in Europe. So in Europe, you had uh, Machiavelli here is whining. He's like, these because they ain't even killing each other. You understand? But they're, they're doing, what they're doing is they're besieging towns, and they're taking ransoms. And, and they're not ransoms, they're taking prisoners, and blah, blah, blah. They're doing that, you know, because they, they realize, look, you know, it ain't worth it. You know, if it's just these, these kings who kind of just want territory... And they want to flex their muscle and all that, but you know, so so they they willing to fight over over you know basically other people's lands, the farmers' lands. Uh, they're willing to fight and you know decide whatever, but they're not willing to die. They're not willing to do all this winter stuff, uh, blah, blah blah. But that's not to say that you know, of course, Wazungu is still bloodthirsty and all that, and and, and but it's just to say that you know, there's a general pattern uh, among like 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 if you go down and. To the to the ground level, right? If you go down to the ground level, there are, these are the things that's going that happens. So it's the same with, you know, let's say we decide, hey, we got to do stuff in Africa, because that, that's what I'm saying. Like, like, like I, I bring up Taharka, right? I think it was his father Pianke, uh, who who took over uh, ancient Kemet, and it's like he was like, look, you can surrender. You know what I mean? You can surrender. We we good with that. We don't have to fight. We got these soldiers. We have the capacity. We have the capability, but you could surrender. You understand? And that, and that that's sometimes what it is. You know, like real people, a lot of people, and, and I want to say, like, why people are afraid to die? Okay? Why people are afraid to die? But but you're not you're not really threatening them. But a lot of but but if but if they feel threatened, yes, they will surrender. Okay? They will surrender. All right. Let's keep going. Auxiliary armies, which are what you have when you call on some other ruler to come with his forces to help you to defend your town, are the other useless kind of armed forces. Pope Julius tried them very recently, having seen how miserably his mercenaries performed in his Herrera campaign. He turned to auxiliaries and ranged with King Ferdinand of Spain to come to his assistance with men and armies. Such an army may be useful and good in itself, but they are all, almost never helpful to a ruler who asks for them to come across to help him. If they lose... He loses too. If they win, he is their prisoner. Right? There are plenty of examples in ancient history, but I want to stay with Pope Julius II's obvious James decision to put himself at the mercy of a foreigner in his desire to get Ferrara. But his good fortune now brought a third element into the equation, saving him from the likely consequences of his rash choices. His Spanish auxiliary were defeated at Ravenna. The Swiss, to his and everyone's surprise, rose up and drove out the French conquerors, so Julius didn't become a prisoner of his enemies because they fled or of his auxiliaries because they hadn't given him his victory but that was incredibly good luck it doesn't make the pope's behavior sensible when a defenseless florentine sent 10,000 frenchmen to take pisa on their behalf they exposed themselves to more danger than they have ever been in before the emperor of constantinople wa constantinople wanting to fend off his neighbors brought 10,000 turks into greece when the war was over those turks didn't want to leave this was the start of Greece's domination by the infidels. You know, like you bring in ten, like like again, that's the thing you got to realize about military forces. You talking about, uh, and that's the thing, like 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 we have this on Cobia, right? We have, let's say, we have twenty thousand soldiers at our disposal. All right, then a neighboring nation says, "Oh, we need some help," and, and we give we give them ten thousand soldiers. Now we got ten. Now we ten thousand deep. You feel me? Now we ten thousand deep. Now now of course. Now, big up, big up the numbers. This is like, you know, this is like 500 years ago, right? You're talking about you got an army of, well, I mean, that's still a, still a big army. So you have an army of, of say, a million. Now you got 500,000 people in another country. 
R to T. You understand what I'm telling you? So it's bad for other countries to use auxiliary. But, but you can send some auxiliary. You know what I'm saying? See, if, if you're going to win, do you hear me? You paying attention? You ain't paying attention. All right, so who should use auxiliary then? Someone who wants to lose battles. So if you want to lose battles, have auxiliary. <laughs> Auxiliaries are much more risky than mercenaries because with them, is the disaster is ready-made. An auxiliary army is united in its obedience to someone other than you. When a mercenary army has won your battle for you, it will need time and a good opportunity to do you any harm. They don't constitute a tightly bound unit. You chose them, you pay them, and the outsider whom you have put in command of them won't immediately have enough authority to harm you. What is most dangerous about mercenaries is their reluctance to fight. What is most dangerous about auxiliaries is their virtue. Uh, this comes close to saying mercenaries are dangerous because they won't fight, and auxiliaries are dangerous because they will. And that, that's what I'm saying. This white boy don't even understand. He doesn't like, like the guy who's trying to translate this doesn't even understand what, what Machiavelli is saying. And this is what this is what it is with white folk, you know? And this is this is him not understanding the white person. So that's why you shouldn't even trust white translations of black works. Because he's reading the white work and he don't understand. Then he's saying, look, what is most dangerous about the mercenaries is their reliance to fight reluctance to fight. But he's saying what is most dangerous about that is their virtue. That is he's like what is most dangerous is their loyalty to the other uh prince. That's what he's talking about. But these white folk, they, they translate and they're like, well, I think of... Stupid ass, man. That's why I'm saying, man. Y'all be talking... See, the, the reason why I can get up and speak is because I know white people ain't shit. Okay? A lot of you think white people shit. That, that, uh, white, white people is, 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 is the bee's knees. That, that's what a lot of y'all think. So that's why, you know, when I, when I hear y'all, I'm like, what are you... What are you, you know, this is what this guy said. You know? Like, 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 like y'all be fighting over things... I want to I want to put this because uh, like all right I want to say again there was like an election in America right and then afterward there was like some election poll results you know for exit exit polls and black folk were fighting over the exit polls knowing damn well the white folk don't know how to carry out good statistics how do y'all African mind man so all right so the wise prince has always avoided mercenaries and auxiliaries relying instead on his own men preferring a defeat with them to a victory with foreign troops because he doesn't think that. That would be a real victory. I never hesitate to cite Cesare Borgia and his actions. This duke entered Romagna with auxiliaries, the only soldiers he had were French, and with them he captured Imola and Forli, but he came to think that these forces weren't reliable, so he turned to the Arsini and Vitelli troops, mercenaries, thinking them to be safer, but they turned out to be dangerous also, unreliable in battle and disloyal. So he got rid of them, disbanding the troops and killing their leaders, dang, and turned to his own men. The difference between a homegrown army and those others can easily be seen in what happened to the Duke's reputation as he moved from the French to the Arsini and Vitelli and from them to relying on his own soldiers whose loyalty to him increased as time went on. He was never esteemed more highly than when everyone saw that he was a complete master of his own army. And, and yeah, yeah, all right. I plan to stay with recent events in Italy, but I can't omit Hidero of Syracuse, uh, whom I have already mentioned in the passage. When I reported that the Syracusans gave him command of their army in the 3rd century, he soon discovered that the mercenary element in this army was useless because it was led, except at the very top, by officers much like our recent mercenary commanders. He didn't think he could retain the services of these mercenaries or disband them, so he arranged for them to be cut to pieces. To attack barbarians who had occupied Messina, Hero brought his mercenaries and also the citizen components of his army. Apparently the latter was going to attack from a different angle. He sent the mercenaries in unsupported, and they were slaughtered by the barbarians. From then onward, he made war using his own forces and not uh, foreigners. And see, this is what I'm saying about why why, why people don't want to be infantry. You know what I mean? Not to say that, you know, that's not a good thing to have infantry, but sometimes, you know, the commanders up top uh, might be leading you to your death. Okay? This is why, I, but of course, you know, you don't, you don't want that. All right? You don't want that. So, you know, that's fine. But, you know, that, that's, just, that's just what it is. You know, uh, that's just what it is. Speaking of which, I'm not even sharing my screen on uh, on, uh, on on Discord, so I started sharing it now. All right. A certain Old Testament episode is relevant here. Okay. Uh, so he's going to the Wazungu Bible. So David volunteered to fight the Philistine champion Goliath, and Saul tried to encourage him by letting him use his own armor. David tried it on and immediately rejected it, saying that he couldn't use it and wanted to meet the enemy with his own sling and knife. The moral is that someone else's armor will fall from your back or weigh you down or hamper your movements. See, this is why I tell you about 
how, 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 you're not listening to me when I say that these white folk are doing worship. You doing worship, they doing worship. He's like, look, man, the story in this Bible that we all read is about warfare. It has a secret moral about warfare. Charles the Seventh of France, by fortune and virtue, liberated France from the English, and he saw the need to be armed with forces of his own and passed laws to establish a national army with cavalry and infantry. His son, Louis the Eleventh, later abolished the infantry and began to enlist Swiss mercenary soldiers. That was the first of a series. And I, and I want to just point this out, too, that you could technically have mercenaries and, 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 and auxiliaries of multiple countries, you know? Of multiple countries that way none of them are really dominant in your force the difference but here right here you see disbanding y your whole infantry for a whole other s nation is that's that's where the trouble is so that was the first of a series of blunders which as anyone can now see led the kingdom into great danger raising the reputation of the Swiss he had depressed the standing of his own army he has disbanded the infantry forcing his cavalry to depend on foreign infantry and they are now so accustomed to fighting along with Swiss that they seem not to be able to win any battles without them the upshot is that the French cannot stand against the Swiss, and they can't do well against others without the help of the Swiss. The armies of the French then have become mixed, partly mercenary and partly national, composed of citizen soldiers. Such a mixed force is much better than a purely mercenary one or one composed entirely of auxiliaries, but is nowhere near as good as the purely citizen army. The French example proves this. The Kingdom of France would have been invincible if Charles' military system had been developed or at least maintained. And and again, like 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 that's what I and see the, the thing is that you can't even go to war with the Swiss. You understand? Uh, that's another thing. But men are so lacking in prudence that they will. Well, unless I mean, uh, if you had an auxiliary, you know, uh, if you had a Swiss auxiliary, maybe Swiss mercenaries. I don't know, because the mercenaries might not necessarily be loyal to the, their own nation. But who knows? Maybe they could be. But you know what I'm saying? Like as opposed to, like like who? Where is the loyalty? That's the question. But men are so lacking in prudence that they will start on something that looks good at the beginning without noticing that there is a poison hidden in it. Compare what I said above about diagnosing tuberculosis. A prince who can't spot, spot trouble the moment it is born, and very few people can, is not truly wise. What started, the downfall, what started the downfall of Roman Empire? It was their starting to employ Goths as mercenaries. And if you don't know, the Goths are the ones who, who destroyed uh, Rome. From that time, the Roman Empire began to weaken, its virtue being drained off of it and into the gods. I conclude that a principality that doesn't have its own army isn't safe. It is entirely dependent on Fortuna, having left itself with no virtue to defend it in times of trouble. So Fortuna being luck, okay? Wise men have always held that nothing is as uncertain and unstable as a reputation for power that isn't based on one's own strength. This is Tacitus. If you don't know Tacitus, that's like a, a ancient Greek historian, I think, or Roman. But what I mean by one's own army is an army composed of one's own subjects or citizens or dependents. Any others are mercenaries or auxiliaries. The right way to organize one's armed forces can easily be worked out from how the four men I have discussed, the Sarah Borgia, Hiero, Charles VII, and David, went about things, and from considering how Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, and many republics and princes have armed and organized their states, procedures that I wholeheartedly endorse. And I shouldn't have said the Great. You know, but I, I don't remember what the witty uh, replacement for that was, so that's what it is. Chapter 14, a prince's military duties. So a prince then ought to devote any of his serious time or energy to anything but war and how to wage it. Dang. A prince then. Like, this is a highlight right here. Oh, matter of fact, it looks like the whole thing. This is the only thing that is appropriate for a ruler and it has so much virtue that it no, not only enables those who are born princes to stay on their throne, but also and often enables ordinary citizens to become princes. And on the other hand, it's clear that the prince who has given more thought to life's refinements than to arms has lost their state. All right. Let me see this. Let me, let me highlight this. See, because I'm thinking about putting, putting this stuff in a book, you know? Uh, you know, because I don't really think black people should be reading white books, post books, you know? But so I'm thinking that if, if, if there were, maybe if I could just do five of these white boys, put some of their quotes and some of their analysis together, you know what I mean? Then, then, then maybe, right? But look at this right here. A prince devote any serious time to, on energy to anything but war and how to wage it. That's it. 
If you're looking to be a nation builder, I mean, you, you need to have good laws. You you can't just say, oh, I want to have war. I want to have war, 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 war. You know, there has to be something after the war. You know, it's like revolution and resolution. You know, that's what Adi Rafo says. Revolution and resolution. But all the same, like, you you got to put some energy into this revolution. you got to put some energy into how, how what is war and how to wage it. Oh, you got to put some energy and time into war and, and, and how to wage it. Because all this other stuff is just, it's just you know, like sometimes I'll be listening to people talk. And they're talking and talking and talking and talking. And I'm just like, you're talking too damn much about things that got nothing to do with war. You understand? You're talking too damn much about things that got nothing to do with war. It's either war, right, or, 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 or laws. You understand? That's it. What you going to do after you win this war? That's it. Francesco Sforza, a private citizen with his own armed force, became Duke of Milan. And his sons, by neglecting military matters, went from being dukes to being private persons. Apart from the other evils that come from having no military force, there is the contempt of others. And this is one of the disgraceful things that a prince should guard himself against. And I will show later on in chapter 19, starting on page 39, there's simply no comparison between an armed man and an unarmed one. And it's not reasonable to expect an armed man to be willing to obey one who is unarmed. Right? Nor is it reasonable to think that an unarmed man will be secure when he's surrounded by armed servants, soldiers. With their contempt and his suspicion, they won't be able to work well together. Look at this. Look at this. This is this is the thing that like a lot of, like I want you to because I mean like a lot of you, a lot of you. A lot of you are saying to this, like, like you say, look at just how this police officer killed this unarmed black man. Look at this police officer killed this unarmed black man. Look at this police officer killed this unarmed black man. And look how they treat those armed white men. Those white men are armed and they're treated with so much respect. They're treated with so much respect and they're armed. They're armed and dangerous and the police are showing them so much respect. But look how they kill us unarmed black men. Like, are you thinking? Are you thinking? And some of you, some of you, I'm telling you, like, some of you sitting there like, man, older, you just, then you just got to think to yourself. Be like, for real, we was going off about how these black men were unarmed. How they killing unarmed black men. Die, they going to kill if you unarmed. And, and the thing is this too, that, like a lot of times when, when the brother's unarmed, he... He looking to be, he, he acting like he in a power position. He's like, man, you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> you know? Well, get the fuck off me. You know? You know what I mean? Like a lot of times, you know, a lot of times when people are unarmed, that's when they decide to be badasses. No, you got to be a badass when you armed. That, 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 that's, how, that's, how the, that's how brothers be in, in the hood, you know, uh, like that's how they be treating like us amongst ourselves. You know? Like, like, they be like, hey, man, where you going? And you like, man, I'm going wherever. I, and then they like, they flash their gun. And you're like, oh, I mean, you know, it's probably just heading to the... You know what I mean? <laughs> like, 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 they know, they know that the arms gives them that sort of, like, 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 like they, they understand that. Now, here's the police walking around armed to the T. And I'm talking about America, because, you know, sometimes, some places, the police are not armed, right? Uh, they're armed to the T. And you there like, get the fuck out of my way. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming victims, okay? I'm not blaming victims, but but you have to see again. This this is not this is not me. This is not me saying it. This is not white folk today saying it. This is a white boy talking in the 16th century among other white people. There's simply no comparison between an armed and an unarmed one, and it's not reasonable to expect an armed man to be willing to obey one who is unarmed. Nor is it reasonable to think that an unarmed man will be secure when he's surrounded by armed servant soldiers with their contempt and his suspicion they won't be able to work well together. This, this right here is the quote-unquote George Floyd. You know, I don't want to, maybe it might be too soon. But I'm just saying, you know, you tell him, hey, get off me. And it's like, no. What are you going to do? You know, these white people have this phrase that goes, you in what army? Like, like, if you say, hey, man, get out of my way, they're like, okay, make me move. Right? Or, or not make me move, they say, you, you know, you're like, I want you to do this. And they say, you in what army? As I say that, if you trying to be the authority, you need an army. They give you 
all the clues. They give you all the clues. And and, and, and it's, it's, it's in their language. It's in everything. But you're still playing around. All right? So the preceding sentence seems to warn the prince against moving among his soldiers without carrying a sword. The next sentence warns him against an attentiveness to military matters. Perhaps one is meant as a kind of metaphor for the other. So a prince who does not understand the art of war can't be respected by his soldiers and can't trust them. Uh, right here. So this is something interesting. So he says, I want to think that an unarmed man will be secure when he's surrounded by armed servants, equal soldiers, with their contempt and his suspicions, they won't be able to work well together. Uh... Now again, now it's not necessarily that you want the the. I that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. This white boy doesn't understand what he's reading, but you know it's what it is. What it is you know what I'm saying? Uh, he translated it. It's all good, right? So, uh, yeah. But like basically, uh, it's not that you got to be armed because you you're still not going to be a threat to them. But you have to establish why you the freaking leader. You know. You can't, you can't be, this is why I'm saying that you, you got to understand about, like, like I said, you open the book of power, open up the book of power, okay? Open up the book of power, right? And, and just read it, okay? Because you're going to see, like, the hierarchy of the military, right? And basically, because the thing is, is a soldier might not necessarily understand the whole battlefield. But you as the prince, the king, well, I call him the king, I call him a nessu. Right, you as the Nessu, right, uh, can understand the whole battlefield. Okay, because the information is coming to you. It's not coming to every soldier. Okay, and so therefore you're gonna be armed in that sense because you have the knowledge of the art of war. If you if you are just playing like if you're doing like what 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 you, this guy I guess Trump is doing, you know, if you're just going golfing all the time, right? Then you don't, you're not really studying how to freaking win war. And then not, nah, the soldiers ain't with you. Now, of course, in America, they're they actually pretty loyal to him. I don't know why, but they're loyal to him. Whatever. It's, it is what it is. Right? But 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 if you're talking about if, if Africa had a leader, a real leader, and we were we was about doing stuff, okay? Like like you could you could forget, you know, this whole little black people are cursed and we have a, we're the lowest. You could forget that. Okay? You can forget that. And this, this is why, you know, we have to get to work. Okay? We have to get to work because we could lift our people up. Okay? <laughs> he said, anyone else is going to with that voice pressure? Peace to bit of medicine. <laughs> that was a good voice pressure. You know that. <laughs> anyway, so, a prince, therefore, should never stop thinking about war, working at it even harder in times of peace than in wartime. He can do this in two ways, physically and mentally. So here's the physical preparations for war. As well as keeping his men well organized and drilled, the prince should spend a lot of time hunting. Through this, he can harden his body to strenuous exercise and also learn about the terrain, how the mountains rise, how the valleys open out, how the plains lie, and the nature of rivers and marshes. I want to tell you guys, so there's this one video game I did try to play. I'll, I'll tell you guys about it because F it, you know? Uh, it's a it's a mad Wazungo game. I don't even like it. I didn't finish it. Uh, some some white boy uh, that like I have a relative who knows white people, <laughs> and so they connected me with this white boy, and so well or at least they 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 tried to connect. Me. I don't know. Basically, this white boy played this video game. I tried it because uh, I thought my brother said he liked it, but my brother actually said he didn't like it. I didn't know. I wasn't paying attention, but because uh, you know I just kind of tune out. Anyway, point is this. I think it's called like. Wait, let me see. It's like Kingdom Come or something? Not Kingdom Come. Uh, it's supposed to be like this hyper-realistic Wazungu game, though. Uh, I want to say... I want to say it's Kingdom Come. Uh, yeah, Kingdom Come Deliverance, I think. Anyway, it's a mad white game. But here's the thing that happened in the game. The prince there goes hunting. Right? So so you try, you're just like a regular-ass commoner who's trying to you know, be somebody or whatever, going on fights and all that crap, and, you know, you meet a prince who's like, who's, who's not going to his duties, he's more or less hanging out in the brothel, and his uncle don't like him because of, you know, it's like, oh, you, you're supposed to be the ruler, but you're there hanging out in brothels and all that stuff, and what happens, if, what's going to happen if I die, and where are you going to be, blah, 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 but he's like, but they, they bring about hunting, and the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of these white folk, when they, they get these impressions of, 
we're going to have hunting as an option in this game. Okay? We're going to have because of books like this. So they read Machiavelli. They read Middle, Middle, uh, Middle Ages literature. They read all these things and then they implement them into the video game so that later on, their youth are playing these games and kind of low-key getting knowledge about war. You know, I want you to understand that a lot of these video games that white folk play are about warfare. You know? Because I remember one time I was sitting down playing games when I had a wife at the time. And I was like, you know, is this kind of shameful? And she goes, well, it's not that bad because all the games you play are, are about strategy. They're all strategy games. You understand? And, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a good thing. You know, I'm not saying it's not a bad thing. Right? But but it's 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 it kind of hints at what white folk are really doing. Almost all of their media, including their movies, including their films, have to do with warfare and or conflict and conflict resolution. In fact, even when you go to study writing, because I, I remember this one sister was doing this writing lesson. She was like, we're going to do it. I'm going to show you guys how to write. I'm going to teach you guys how to write. And here's the basis. Basically, every piece, of, and she says, every, every, everything you write is going to have to be one of three conflicts. Man versus man, man versus nature, man versus uh, society. Okay? Now, of course, when I said I'm going to write Zubiri, I'm going to write it without any sort of conflict like that. But all the same, this is what she was telling you, that everything they do has conflict, has conflict resolution, has war at the basis. That's why I brought up the game. I shouldn't even said the name, though, real talk. But, like, that's what it is. They showed you the hunting. You're like, why, is, why are they doing hunting? The reason why they put hunting in the game is because here's what Machiavelli said was a good physical representation for hunting. And why hunting? Because you can learn about the terrain. You can learn about the mountains. You can shoot. You can keep yourself fit. So the mountain rises. The valleys open out. How the plains lie. The nature of rivers and marshes. Because the thing is this, that when you now go out onto the field, right, when you now got your army ready to march, you know what valley to hide in. You know what plains to lay down in. You know what rivers to get your water from. All this should be studied with greatest care because it gives the prince knowledge that is useful in two ways. A better grasp of the terrain of his own country will equip him to make a better job of defending it. See that? And secondly, his knowledge and observations of that terrain will make it easier for him to understand others, i.e. the hills, valleys, plains, rivers, marshes of Tuscany, for example, are quite like those of other provinces. A prince who lacks this skill lacks the main thing a commander needs, namely the ability to find his enemy, to decide where to pitch camp, to lead his armies on route marches, to plan battles, to besiege towns to his own advantage. Remember this, they didn't have Bluetooth back then. Okay, they didn't have Bluetooth back then. So if you are marching from point A to point B, and you know, you can, if you take a wrong turn, you're going to have to turn back. And you just wasted a lot of time and you wasted a lot of rations and resources. Because, again, when they travel, they're not traveling like you or me. You know, where we got, we got, you know, like, let's say you you driving for, you know, let's say, because let's say they, they walking for, let's say, 10 miles or let's say 20 miles. Right. But there's no food stores in between. You know what I'm saying? There's no map. Like, there's a map. But but at the same time, you don't, you don't know if there's a ditch. The, the, the maps are not necessarily... You know, oh, there's a ditch over here. There's a so on and so forth. You know, the cartographer might not necessarily have worked out all of that stuff. You know? Or there might be a down tree in the way that's blocking everything. You know? And then, of course, your military, your army got to do stuff to, you know, all that. So, there was a, it's a different time. But, of course, it's the same today. You know, if we in Africa and we got to go from point A to point B and you taking the wrong turn. Come on. One of the things... For which uh, Prince Prince uh, Verne's Philopomen, Prince of the Achaeans, was the fact that in times of peace he thought about nothing but war. And story, which historians praise this guy for, right? Out in the countryside with friends, he would often stop and invite them into a discussion. He says, if the enemy should be up on that hill and we were here with our army, which side would be better placed? How could we attack him without breaking ranks? If he tried to retreat, how could we cut him off? 
Along the way, he would talk to them about all the situations that an army might be in, listening to their opinions, and present and defend his own, so that by their continual discussions, he was prepared to cope with any emergency that might arise in time of war. This is what we should be doing on the continent. We should be walking through, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you know we, see, we see one of these buildings. And see, some of y'all go in, you see the building, you're like, hey, man, I think the girls around here are pretty. Yeah, the girls around there are pretty. But the question is, what, what, would, what would happen if these Iskari tried to attack us right now? Okay? What if we had our, our armed forces with us right now? How, how, and they, they were trying to retreat. How could we cut them off? We over here, they over there. How, how, we, how could we cut them off? What could we do? What should we, what should we have with us to make sure they can't run? Okay? Come on. Mental preparation for war. The prince should study historical accounts of the actions of great men to see how they conducted themselves in war. He should study the causes of their victories and defeat so as to avoid the defeats and imitate the victories. And above all, he could model himself on some great man of the past, a man with no doubt, a man who no doubt modeled his conduct on some still earlier examples. As it is said, Alexander the Great modeled himself on Achilles, Caesar on Alexander, and Scipio on Cyrus. Any reader of Xenophon's life of Cyrus will see how much Scipio profited from imitating him, how he conformed himself in honesty, affordability, humanity and generosity to what Xenophon reported of Cyrus. You see, this is why I'm saying that this is why we should be we should really have some good biographies of our people. And we should have some biographies that make of them perfect men. You know? Cuz cuz like, even when you say, well look, you know, the, the biography of Marcus Garvey kind, kind of disappointed a little, you know, in that sense. You know, cuz you reading and you like, man, Garvey is so good, Garvey is so good. And you're like, oh, but he was he was kind of neglecting this woman. You know what I mean? And you're like, dang, that's, you know, make you feel a type of way. But, I mean, it's it's understood. That was his wife. You know, she could tell that story. That was her, that was partly her story, right? But now, if you telling the story of Garvey, you might, because like, I, I say, like I said, I don't, I try not to say, I mean, I might have said too much just now, but, <laughs> but I try not to say, you know, I don't want to repeat that. I want you to imitate the life of Garvey, okay? Sure, now I got to wonder, you know, sure. Too. Somebody, somebody asked me to do my biography. I'm gonna have to tell them a bunch of stuff, and not tell them some other stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I might not tell them some other stuff. Uh, but let's keep it going. Let's keep it moving. Uh, how, how you doing, family? Y'all at home doing good? Uh, wherever you at? All right. A wise prince will follow some such rules as these. He won't idle away time of peace. Rather, he will use them as an opportunity to increase his resources to manage times of adversity, so that if his fortuna changes, he will find him ready to fight back. So this is chapter 15, things for which men, especially princes, are praised or blamed. Okay, so the next topic is how a prince should conduct himself towards a subject and his friends. Many others have written about this, so I suppose it will seem rash of me to go into it again, especially given the difference between what I shall say and what others have said. But I am not apologetic about this. My aim is to write things that will be useful to the reader, who understands them. So I find it more appropriate to pursue the real truth of the matter than to repeat what people have imagined about it. So many writers have dreamed of, of republics and principalities such as have never been seen or known in the real world. And that's what I'm saying. Like, this, this, like, like he's not even talking about socialism, but you already know. You understand? He's not talking about socialism, but that's the same thing. People are like, well, oh, well, you know, be like deal with the, the world was, a, you know, we're all just peaceful and the dictatorship of the proletariat. Like, what are you talking about? Proletariat to garbage. No disrespect to y'all. <laughs> no disrespect. But but like if you talking about waging war, right? You talking about the global like you talking about waging war, how you gonna wage war like like you know, you're required like it don't even make no damn sense. The whole planet's gonna be under one government that's being ruled by like that doesn't make no damn sense. And, and how you gonna get about with this? How you gonna go about with the whole world? You just gonna convince everybody to give all their resources for you? You know? Sure. Out here, like, 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 like. Uh, that's all I zoom with, so you actually wore a PMI. But still, you know, many writers have dreamed of you know worlds that never have you know utopia. That's what they call it. And attending to them is dangerous because the gap between how men live and how they ought to live is so wide that any prince who thinks in terms not of how people do behave. But of how they ought to behave will destroy his power rather than maintaining it. This is what I'm saying. Like, you talking about, oh, well, you know, socialism. Socialism is how, how people ought to behave, but how do people really behave? 
You know, as I said, you know, I, I put up a tweet. I tell you, this is the top ten tweets or whatever, right? I put up a tweet about how you going to hold these white proletariat accountable in the quote-unquote dictatorship of the proletariat. How you going to hold them accountable? They're bloodthirsty. Come on. A man who tries to act virtuously will soon come to grief at the hands of the unscrupulous people surrounding him. Thus, a prince who wants to keep his power must learn how to act immorally, using or not using his skill according to necessity. Now, I mean, of course, I'm not going to necessarily agree with this, okay? But this is what this white boy is saying, so we're going to keep with it, all right? So setting aside fantasies about princes, therefore, and attending to reality, I say that when men are being discussed, and especially princes because they are more prominent, it is largely in terms of qualities they have that bring them blame or praise. For example, one is said to be free spending, another miserly. One is described as generous, another as grasping. One is merciful, another is cruel. <coughs> one as keeping his word, another as breaking it. One bold and brave, another effeminate and cowardly. And of course, you know, I want you to remember that, you know, you want to try to avoid the word effeminate uh, <laughs> only because uh, the implication. But all the same, you know, it makes sense, all right? One as friendly, another as arrogant. I'm just saying that in this, this day, this this climate, okay? This climate, particularly as, you know, like, for instance, uh, you know, brother of, of a Bit of Medicine podcast, uh, Koku, he was saying, like, he was like, women and nation building. And he had, he had a whole podcast on that. And how women feel like they're not, you know, whatever, part of it. So you don't really want to use these terms, even though everybody knows what it means. But you don't want to use those terms just because you don't really want to isolate. You know, you don't want to give fuel to to, to pushing women away. You know what I mean? Because, like, cause like, when you was effeminate, for instance, if you really was going in, yeah, men are too effeminate. Men are too effeminate. Like, they're already telling you, man, well, get these women out of here. Like, if there's women in the room, you know, speaking in front of, you know, that's already telling you. So it's like, it's like you don't want to use that word. Like, you can use cowardly, right? I mean, you know, and like, just, just even saying that the two are the same is just like, you know, that, that's a, that's already, if I was a woman, if I were a woman, I would be offended. You know what I'm saying? Even though I know you're not talking about me, right? I, I, I would feel, I would be offended. You know? Uh, anyway, but let's see. One is friendly, another as arrogant. Uh, one is chaste, another as promiscuous. One is straightforward, another as devious. One is firm, another as variable. One is grave, another as frivolous. One as religious, another as unbelieving, and so on. We'll all agree that it would be a fine thing for a prince to have all the good qualities in that list, but the conditions of human life make it impossible to have and exercise all those qualities. So a prince has to be wary in avoiding the vices that would cost him his state. He should also avoid, as far as he can, the vices that would not cost him his state. But he can't fully succeed in this, so he shouldn't worry too much about giving himself over to them. And he needn't be anxious about getting a bad reputation for vices, without which it would be hard for him to save his state. All things considered, there's always something that looks like virtue, or would bring him to ruin if he adopted it. And something that looks like vice, or would make him safe and prosperous. So he didn't even go into... Oh, okay, so the free spend and the tight one. So this chapter primarily concerns item 1 on the list of 33, but a few turns of phrases indicate that Machiavelli thinks of the items... And as coming into it also. The next chapter that goes straight to most, though not all, previous translations use generosity to translate uh, Machiavelli's liberate, and that is wrong. In one way, too narrow, another, too broad for what Machiavelli is talking about. So let's see, starting with item one in the list on page 33, it's nice to be regarded as a free spender, but this is dangerous for a prince, as I now explain. If you spend freely in an entirely virtuous way, so that nobody knows about it, that won't do you any good. Indeed, you'll be criticized as a tightwad. Uh, so anyone who wants to have a reputation as a free spender will devote all his wealth to this end, and will eventually have to burden his subjects with taxes and do everything he can to get money. This will make his subjects hate him, and in his poverty he won't have anyone's respect. Uh, thus, by spending his money around, he has offended many and rewarded few. He is now very vulnerable, and at the first touch of danger, he will go down. If he sees this and tries to change course, he'll get a reputation for being a miser. You know, that's actually reminds me of this thing that's going around right now. People are like, oh, well, these Democrats are asking for money, you know? <laughs> and actually, it's the same thing. It's like, oh. Like, like even if they were generous in their private lives, they're not really, you know, bragging about it or whatever, but, you know, it's whatever. Uh, because a prince can't publicly exercise this virtue of free spending without paying a high price for it, if he is wise, he won't be afraid of being thought to be a miser. Because no one will think, 
Oh, you say, so the prince can't publicly exercise his virtue of free spending without paying a high price for it. If he is wise, he won't be afraid of being thought to be a miser, because no one will think that about him when they see that by reigning in his spending, he leaves himself with the resources needed to defend himself against all attacks and to tackle various projects without burdening his people. His management of his wealth, therefore, works well for the countless people from whom he doesn't take anything, and badly for the small group of people to whom he doesn't give anything, and to whom he would have given gifts if he had followed the free spending route. Everything great that has been done in our time was the work of someone who was regarded as a miser. Other people's attempts at great things have all failed. Pope Julius II was, uh, helped toward the papacy by his reputation as a free spender, but after becoming Pope, he dropped that in order to be capable of making war. The present King of France has conducted many wars without imposing any extra tax burden on his subject, because his additional wartime expenses have been covered by his cost-cutting measures. The present king of Spain wouldn't have undertaken, let alone succeeded in, so many campaigns if he had had a reputation for splashing his money around. Marginaliness is one of the vices that enables a prince to govern. And this is one of the things that you have to remember, too. Like, if you go back to The Art of War by Sun Tzu, uh, that's another one of Wazungu that you probably, that, you, that it's okay if you study, right? But uh, he's talking about how, like, if you go to war, you might have to start taxing your people more. And if you're taxing your people more, they're not even with the war anymore. You know what I'm saying? The morale of the people drops because suddenly you there, you know, like it's a it's a cost on them. You know, oh, we got, you know, I'm, I'm eating less so that you could go wage war in another country. That don't make no damn sense to me, right? Uh, here's the thing: if you are cutting costs on your own and you don't have to impose any extra taxes, nobody gives a shit. You understand? Know it's like it's like what happened with the Iraqi war, okay? Now, now, hear this. When, when America go, America is still at war with Iraq, they say. Okay? If America is still at war with Iraq, imagine if America raised taxes to go to war with Iraq. And, like, raised taxes significantly. So, let's say 15, 20% to go to war with Iraq. You think you would, you think you'd be sitting by when that war was happening? You think you ain't protesting the fact that you gotta eat less? And, 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 and it's made clear. It's made clear. Oh, yeah, the reason why Cause we at war, and that's why, and this wars cost money. Shit, you already know. And this is why, this is partly why what the Iraqi strategy is to make it so that it costs more. That's that's part of it's why you would even wage war with a, with a people is to make it cost more. You know why why you wouldn't surrender right away? Cause cause when they when it costs more, when it, when the morale go, drops for the people, then suddenly the all, their own citizens are like, nah, we ain't with it. Stop it. Stop the war. Stop it. Stop it. I don't give a shit. You understand? I don't mean to curse. I'm sorry, but still, you get what I'm saying? You know, so so you gotta you gotta understand and try to manage affairs accordingly. Okay. Let's see. Uh, it may be objective. Caesar splashes wealth around en route for the top position in Rome, and many others have reached the highest position by spending freely and being known to do so. I reply: either you are a prince already, or you are on the way to becoming one. <coughs> if you have arrived. This open-handedness with wealth is dangerousness. It was dangerous, as I have shown. But if you are still on the way, you need to be regarded as free with your wealth. Caesar was one of those who wanted to become the prince in Rome, but if he had survived after coming out on top, and if he hadn't then cut back on his expenses, he would have, uh, so he says, destroyed his power, right? But could mean destroyed the empire. Uh, I mean, whatever. Like, this guy doesn't understand what he's saying. But anyway, but destrotto quello imperio. Right? So you see it's actually Italian. Right? So a possible renewed objection. Many princes who have done great things with armies have been regarded as free, very free with their wealth. And answering you, I distinguish two cases. And see, this is why, this is why I, I, I got to give Machiavelli some props for it. Is that it almost seems like, like he, he, he's open to the criticism and addresses it in the freaking book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he, like I, mean, I mean, Joe, I mean, I don't know if I do that. I, I think I just, I just give you all the facts straight up. Right? I mean, I try to I try to weed out the noodle. The, I try to weed out the nuances, but but I mean, you you have to read it yourself. I mean, I mean, like I weed out the nuances, but I don't really express out. You know, oh well, you know, some people might say that this is not a you know. No, nah, I don't do that. But it's it, it's it's an interesting way. But many princes who have done great things with armies have been regarded. Yes, yeah, so none of this, you. I distinguish two cases. A prince is uh, lavish with wealth that is his own and his subjects. A prince is lavish with the wealth of others, 
If one, he ought to be sparing. If two, he ought to take every opportunity to spend freely. As for the prince who leads his army in a campaign supported by pillage, plunder, and extortion, he has at his disposal wealth that belongs to others, and he had better spread it around or his soldiers will desert. So he's talking about if you're... Like when you invade somewhere, you could... you could Like, like for instance, you know, when Wazungu took over Africa, all them statues, like he just gave them to the, the people that was, that, was, that was killing us. You understand? Open-handedness with wealth eats itself up faster than anything. The more you do it, the less you have to do it with. So this is why people don't, like I said, like people be like, why do Democrats don't spend all their money? They're millionaires. Because if you are open-handed with your wealth, right, you're gonna lose it. That's why. But, and and all right. And this is why I was saying because I, I was listening to this white boy speaking for some reason. I was just, you know I decided look I'm gonna listen to these lectures, right? And these white boys was like. This white boy was like, there's a billionaire consciousness and a millionaire consciousness. And he was like, millionaires are usually miserly. But billionaires be like, yeah, I'm going to get that jet. You understand? But but millionaires don't be spending money like that. You know? Billionaires don't give a shit. Because they, they got so much, they got more than they can spend. Obviously. They got a thousand times more than a millionaire. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, but look. So you end up poor and despised or else. Uh, because of the means you took to avoid poverty, rapacious and hated. Uh, wait, so you end up being poor and despised, or else, because of the means you took to avoid poverty, rapacious and hated. Uh, Prince should, above all, protect himself from being despised and hated, and open-handed with wealth leads you to both. So it is wiser to have a reputation for miserliness, which brings criticism without hatred, than to be led by the pursuit of reputation for open-handedness to get a reputation that brings criticism and hatred. So this is right here in a nutshell. When you talk about, like I said, this is the blueprint for colonialism. So a lot of the colonizers have all this wealth. Even when you talk about the enslavement of Africans in, 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 the, in the diaspora, right? The, you say, man, all the white people got all this wealth and then they still treat us like garbage. Duh! Because if they give you too much, then they won't have all that wealth you talk about. Like, like, like I said, if Oprah, somebody was criticizing to Oprah the other day, they were like, Oprah, you know, somebody came to Oprah with this good idea. They said, we want to teach, we want to give uh, prisoners some literacy or something like that. Something like that. You know, something normally something good. So Oprah was like, that's a great idea. And the guy's like, I need a million dollars. Oprah said, I'll give you a thousand dollars a week. And they're like, dang, she cheap. If Oprah just gave everybody a million dollars with a good idea, how much money would Oprah have left? You know what I'm saying? Like it's her money. And the only reason why she got it is because she ain't giving it to you. Pay attention. So he says, chapter 17, cruelty and mercy. It's better to be loved than feared, right? So this is a shout out to uh, Baba Eskenar. I'm sorry, I'm not saying his name wrong, but, you know, he, he, this is the quote that he liked uh, while he was reading. Uh, uh, Bread Medicine said, good point. All right, so let's see, cruelty and mercy. So he's like, coming now to item three in the list of qualities on page 33. I say that every prince should want to be regarded as merciful and not cruel, but he should be careful not to mismanage his mercy. Caesar Borgia was considered cruel, yet his cruelty restored order to Romagna, unified it, and restored it to peace and loyalty. When you come to think about it, you will see him as being more cruel, uh, much more truly merciful than the Florentines, who, to avoid a reputation for cruelty, allowed Pistori Pistoria to be destroyed. Uh, in 1501 the Pisto Pistorians broke out in a small but desperate civil war between two factions. Though the nearby Florentines were in control of the city and actually sent Machiavelli to investigate, they were afraid to intervene effectually, and so the townspeople hacked one another to pieces. So, so the people went to a, a war, and instead of uh, intervening, you know, and, and destroying one side, both sides killed each other. So as long as the prince keeps his subjects united and loyal, therefore he shouldn't, he, he oughtn't to mind being criticized as cruel, because with a very few examples of punitive severity, he'll be showing more real mercy than those who are too lenient, allowing a breakdown of law and order that leads to murders or robberies. Why? Because such breakdowns harm the whole community, whereas a prince's death sentence affect only one person at a time. A new prince is especially st strongly bound to get a reputation for cruelty, that's because new states are so full of dangers. And so this is something that you have to realize too. Like, like, like this is the breakdown, this is the thing that, I mean, I mean, luckily, nobody really listened to me. Okay, luckily nobody would listen to me, but this is the thing that happens when they talk about the riots and all that kind of stuff. It's like white folk try to crash, crack down on this stuff because if a community descends into chaos, 
right? You're gonna have murders, robberies, rapes. You understand? And 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 you want to, if you are the ruler of a community, you want to not have that happen. You know, because a lot of people say right after South Africa had uh, liberation or, or South Africa had uh, independence, right? Uh, a lot of rapes, a lot of robberies, a lot of murders. And I mean, if you were the new leaders of South Africa, you might have been like, well, look, you know, we just want our people to be free. We don't want to crack down. We don't want to think. Even to this day, women don't feel safe in South Africa. Okay? You 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 know, I'm not saying to be cruel. I mean, that, that's, what you're, that's what this boy is saying, right? But you have to understand, you know, that you want to maintain order. And you have to figure out how you do that. And you have to be vigilant about that. That doesn't necessarily mean to be cruel. Like, that's how the white boy is thinking. But all the same, you know, but this is the thing. This is how these white folk are thinking. Listen to me. That's what, how the white folk are thinking. This is the blueprint for colonialism. So when I talk about Kenya, right, because I said we pan-African. When I talk about Kenya, they had concentration. The British had concentration camps. Why? The British had concentration camps in, 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 in Kenya because they understood because you no, know, because their mindset was such that they read Machiavelli. They said, "How can we stop Kenya from having, uh, from from a whole community breakdown? From everybody just saying, oh, ask the the, the British.' That's the, they just gathered and tortured and killed and were cruel because you understand. So let's say, but he shouldn't be too quick in believing that what he is told and acting on it. And he mustn't be afraid of his own shadow, as they say. Rather, he should moderate his conduct with prudence and humanity, not being confident to the point of rashness or suspicious to the point of being intolerable. Now, of course, I guess the British kind of skipped over this phrase. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's the thing. That's what they did on the plantation. And the thing is this, too. On the plantation, because a lot of people don't even understand, but on the plantation, like, of course, they were cruel. But there's also some sort of... Uh, there was also some sort of, uh, like, 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 if you really look at the real story of what was going on in the plantation, okay? If you really look at what was really going on on the plantation, right? You'll see that, you'll see that black folk actually were organized and mobilized and had, like, like, were actually threatening white folk on the plantation. You know? Like, you don't know that because the way how they retell the story is that white, black, black folks was just a bunch of, you know, pussy with people in America. But that wasn't necessarily the case. Apparently, black folks used to hang out at night and harass white folks who were walking by. I don't, it don't really make sense to me neither. So if it don't make sense to you, that's fine. It don't really make sense to me neither because of the stories that we told. It's like, wait, what's going on? But this is what was documented. Okay. So, so we don't even know what the past was like. Okay? We don't even know. But, you know, sure. What you gonna do about that, right? So a question arises out of this. Namely, is it better to be loved than feared or better to be feared than loved? Well, one would like to be both, but it's difficult for one person to be both feared and loved. And when a choice has to be made, it is safer to be feared. The reason for this is a fact about men in general. They are ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, cowardly, and greedy. He's talking about white folk. But the but the, this is it though. This is what I'm telling you. You have to understand your own. We have to understand your enemy. They are ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, cowardly, and greedy. This ain't me saying it. This ain't me saying it. As long as you are offering, as long as you are doing them good, they are entirely yours. They'll offer you their blood, their property, their lives, and their children as long as there is no immediate prospect of their having to make good on those offerings. But when that changes, they'll turn against you. And a prince who relies on their promises and doesn't take other precautions is ruined. Friendships that are uh, bought rather than acquired through greatness or nobility of mind may indeed be earned bought and paid for but they aren't secured and can't be relied on in time of need and men are less hesitant about letting down someone they love than in letting down someone they fear because love affects men's behaviors only through the thought of how they ought to behave 
And men are a low-down lot for whom that thought has no power to get them to do anything they find inconvenient. Whereas fear affects their behavior through the thought of the possible punishment. And that thought never loses its power. Okay? This is how white folk colonize... This is how white people look at other white people. Okay? This is how... They, they say, look, man, we could go into Africa and say, you know... Hey, we came here, we came this far. Uh, <clears throat> let's just put on a white voice, right? We came this far. Dang, it's my same voice, right? <laughs> what the fuck? No, I, I try to do a different voice. Anyway, I, I have to, I have to burn. That's what happened. All right, uh, we we came this far. <laughs> we came this far, and then and we uh we we've done all this other stuff. Uh, we we you know we traded with you, and we've we've uh we 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 we've brought a bunch of technology to your people, and and we treated you well. Right now, would you go into these? Uh, uh, now, what we would want from you is we want some minerals uh, from your soil, and and we'll, we'll, would you help us out with that? Uh, we'd be much appreciative. Right? That's not gonna work. Or even if they said, you know, okay, well, we, we brought you. Um, well, well, we're gonna invite you to come to uh, America. You know, leave your home, leave your home, and come to uh, these these Americans. Just grow, more, just get a bunch of plantation. Uh, uh, get a bunch of cotton for us because. You know, we're not really that good at farming, but you know you're really skillful farmer people. So, so we want to take you from your land, and uh, then we're gonna work you uh, for, for 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 we're gonna work you for hours. Uh, again, you already know how silly that sounds. Instead, they said, "Look, you know, we chained you, and we're only gonna feed you if all this is done. You understand? Know and we might free you if 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 you do. You know, like like you have to understand, it's only the punishment." It's only like, like the white boy didn't have this whip. Why would you do any of the stuff that he's telling you to do? Or why would you? Why would he have? Why would he have the land that you own? Why would you leave your family? You know, you wasn't you wasn't a D O S back then. You was just African. You understand? You were not enslaved back then. They they, they enslaved you. Should a prisoner? No, sorry. Still. A prince should try to inspire fear in such a way that if he isn't loved, he is at least isn't hated. Because being feared isn't much of a burden if one isn't hated. And a prince won't be hated as long as he keeps his hands off his subject's property and their women. Again, white folk don't didn't pay attention to this part because they, they already had that kind of power. Like, like they understood that if you have enough power, you could touch a people's property and their women. And that's what they did. Look, 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 look at the complexion of, 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 of all your friends, right? And see how they differ, okay? Look at the complexion of all your associates, all the people that you enjoy, all the people you like, all the people's books. Look at your bookshelf. Look at all the complexions. Look how they differ. That's because of this white boy, okay? Because he, he didn't want to... And, and, and look at the land. Like, he, he got your property and your women. Come on. When he has to... Proceed against someone's life, he should have a proper justification, a manifest cause for doing so. But see, that's what I'm saying. They made the cause and said, look, you wasn't even a human being. Eventually. But above all things, he must keep his hand off people's property. And this is like white people's property. Because a man will forget the death of his father sooner than he will forget the loss of the property his father left to him. This warning needs to be emphasized because the temptation to go against it is so great. There's never any shortage of excuses for seizing property. Because a prince who has lived by plunder will always find pretext for seizing what belongs to others, in contrast with reasons for taking someone's life, which is harder to find, and when found, are less durable. But when a prince is on a campaign and with his army, with a multitude of soldiers under his command, then he absolutely mustn't worry about having a reputation for cruelty, because that reputation is what holds his army together and has its ready for duty. Hannibal has been praised for, among much else, the fact that he led an enormous mixed race army to fight in foreign lands and never in times of bad or good fortune had any troubles within the army or between the army and himself the only possible explanation for this is his inhuman cruelty which combined with his enormous virtue to make him an object of respect and terror for his soldiers he couldn't have achieved this just through his other virtues without the cruelty now i don't know see he says historians who have admired his achievements while condemning the cruelty that was their principal cause haven't thought hard enough. Okay, so maybe, maybe I don't know. He said that people are, did record that. I don't know. All right, uh, like I gotta, re, I gotta review that, right? But to see that it is really true that his other virtues 
wouldn't have been sufficient on their own. Look at the case of Scipio. His personal excellence made him stand out not only in his own times but in the whole of history. Yet his army mutinied in Spain simply because his undue leniency gave his soldiers more freedom than is consistent with military discipline. Fabius Maximus scolded him for this in the Senate, calling him a corrupter of the Roman army. One of Scipio's senior officers led a part of his army that did terrible harm to the Lurkians, uh, Lurkians, but Scipio, the easygoing Scipio, didn't see that see to it, and they were avenged and didn't punish the arrogant officer. And again, I want you to understand, this is like Wazungu stuff, you know? And not just Wazungu stuff, because again, like I said, Pianke was like, look, it's okay. Like, Pianke, like, the, the ancient Kushites, right, were historically revered for not being cruel, you know? So it's not to say that you have to be cruel, right? I'm saying that white folk think they have to be cruel. That's the difference. I'm not saying you have to be cruel. I'm telling you what white people think. Or white people are telling you what they think, and I'm just reading it to you. Okay, because you ain't read it yet. Or you did read it, and, 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 you know, well, I'm just rereading it to you. You know? You just want to hear me talk about it or something. I don't know. But all right. Uh, didn't see to it that they were avenged and didn't punish their arrogance against the officers. If he had stayed in command of the army, army, Scipio's mildness would eventually have tarnished his fame and glory, but because he was under the Senate's control, this harmful character trait of his not only stayed hidden, i.e. his harmfulness stayed hidden, but actually contributed to his glory. Back for a moment to the question of being feared or loved, I conclude that men decide whom they will love while their prince decides who they will fear. And a wise prince will lay his foundations on what he controls, not what others control. While not caring about whether he is loved, he should try to not be hated, as I said before. Now, this white boy don't care if you hate him, okay? This white boy don't care if you hate him. You know, when you say, oh, man, you know, hey, because a lot, because the thing is, this is too, a lot of you don't even hate white folk. You know, as Brother Koku says, a word, you know? <laughs> Zoinks, white boy, <laughs> right? Sure, I didn't turn on the camera. <laughs> Zoinks! <laughs> All right, anyway. I, I didn't turn on the camera. You're going to see blonde hair, blue eyes, right? <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm playing. All right. Hey, all right. Chapter 18. How princes should keep their words. Uh, so, the chapter deals with them. Uh, four on the line of page 33, though four others also come into the mention. Everyone knows that it is a fine thing for a prince to keep his word and to live with integrity rather than with cunning. But our recent experiences have been that the princes who achieve great things haven't worried much about keeping their word. Knowing how to use cunning to outwit men, they have eventually overcome those who have behaved honestly. And like I said, like I, unfortunately, I lent out my copy of Urugu, and the the whole copy of Urugu isn't available as a as a PDF, although I think two thirds of it is. But that's a book that I really need to go back and read. You know, like I tried to read it at one point, and I was like, this is feel like I'm in college, right? But she's talking about how how other people didn't even have uh, deception. Like, they didn't even know that you could lie. You know, somebody said, hey, where's the shop? You know, they just they just told you where the shop was. They even It didn't even occur to them that somebody could mislead them uh, verbally, you know? Uh, but, 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 but you see, these white folk are like, yeah, man, we can lie. Like, and it's not just him. Uh, there's earlier... White, I think they're earlier white philosophers, but the, uh, but one of them, I remember, he was like, look, the only time you could ever keep your word is if you have a contract. That's the only time you should keep your word if you have a contract. You know? If it's written down, that's the only time you should keep your word. That means that if you just say, if you say, look, man, like, 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 like for instance, I was talking to the sister one time. And the sister was like, you know, if the sister says, you know, if she just tells you, yeah, I'm going you know, to treat you good next time I see you. You know what I mean? Like if she just says that, right? She could be like, man, I was just talking. Right? Now, if you got to just sign the paper... <laughs> All right, of course, you know, you go that far. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's go. You must know there are two sorts of conflict, right? One using the law, the other using force. One appropriate to humans, the other to beasts. But the uh, two sorts of conflict. Uh, one using the law and the other... All right. But the first method is often not sufficient, so men have to rely on the second. A prince, therefore, needs to understand how to avail himself of the beast and the man in himself, because neither of these natures can survive for long without the other. For the beast side of his nature, the prince should choose the fox and the lion. The lion can't defend itself against traps, and the fox can't defend itself against wolves. So the prince needs to be a fox to discover the traps, and a lion to scare off the wolves. 
Those who try to live by the lion alone doesn't understand what they are up to. A prudent Lord, therefore, can't and shouldn't keep his word when that could be used against him, and the reasons that led him to give it in the first place exist no longer. If men were entirely good, this advice would be bad, but in fact they are dismally bad and won't keep their promises to you. Right? So you needn't keep your promises to them. And a prince will never be short of legitimate reasons for not keeping his promise. Uh, countless recent examples of this could be given, showing how many promises have come to nothing because of their faithfulness of princes, the faithlessness of princes, and showing that the most successful princes have been those who knew best how to employ the fox. Right? Uh, and I, I, I think it's important too, because, uh, you know, like it's like early United States, early, early America gets held by the French, right, to defeat the British. And then when the French are going through their revolution, the British say, or the, or the French are going through their, 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 their fight with the British, the, the, the Americans say, oh, we neutral now. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and I think one of, the, one of the reasons, too, was that because the French lost their leader that, they, that America had that alliance with, right, they were like, well, we can't keep a promise to somebody who's dead. You understand? Like, that's what, that's what it is sometimes. And, and this is the thing, too. It's like, you've got to, you've got to, you, you've got, I mean, this is something that's really important, because like, like I said, when we're talking about nation building, we're talking about going to Africa, having a nation, and having our own alliances. And you got to know when you're going to have to have an alliance or not. Because let's say we there, we got a strong nation in that. Let's say we neighbors with some nation that decides to go and fight the, the England. Now, we already don't fought England, let's say, Right? Now, they decide to go fight England again. They're like, yeah, we want to fight England. It's like, look, man. Look, we're trying to handle some stuff. And you and you there trying to fight every other month. Like, you know, like, yeah, it's a race war. It's a race war. You know, like, okay, I feel you. Right? But you're not know, picking a fight over nothing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. That we have to understand that sometimes you got to know when it's a trap. Because you might not even know. But this person might be like, okay, yeah, we fight Britain. They're like, oh, well, we signed an agreement early. And now you fighting them. Good luck. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like you got oh, we fight, we signed a ceasefire, and now you fighting. Good luck. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like you gotta know, who, you gotta know your, your, your. Like, we have to manage our state intelligently. Okay. We gotta manage our state intelligently. That's all I'm saying. All right. I hope y'all feeling me. Hope y'all feeling me. All right. So, but it's necessary to know how to camouflage this characteristic and to be a greater pretender and dissembler. All right. And men are so naive and so uh, dominated by present necessities that a deceiver will always find someone who will let himself be deceived. There's one recent example that I can't pass over in silence. Pope Alexander VI was deceptive in everything he did, used deception as a matter of course, and always found victims. No man ever said things with greater force, reinforcing his promises with greater oaths while keeping his word less. Yet his deceptions always worked out in the way he wanted because he well understood this aspect of mankind. So a prince needn't have all the good qualities I have listed, but he does need to appear to have them. And I go this far. To have those qualities and always act by them is injurious, and to appear to have them is useful, i.e. to appear to be merciful, trustworthy, friendly, straightforward, devout, and to be, and so on, uh, while being mentally prepared to switch any virtue off uh, that will serve your purpose. And it must be understood that a prince, especially a new one, can't always act in ways that are regarded as good. In order to reserve his state, we'll often have to act in ways that are flatly contrary to mercifulness, trustworthiness, friendliness, straightforwardness, and piety. That's why he needs to be prepared to change course according to which way the wind blows, which way Fortuna pushes him. So a prince should take care that he never lets anything slip from his lips that isn't full of the five qualities I have been talking about, so that anyone who sees and hears him will think that he has all of them, i.e. that he is merciful, uh, trustworthy, friendly, straightforward, and devout. This last quality of the appearance of it matters enormously. Nothing matters more. Okay? Now, look at that. Devout. So they're supposed to appear... Like, that's the thing. White people appear to be Christian, even though they so unchristianly. Okay? And he said that's the most important thing. This is why America is like, hey, look, we're Christian. Because I remember, like, look, that's why, that's why I remember when 9 11 happened. When, it's, when Twin Towers hit, somebody asked. They were like, well, if we're a Christian nation, shouldn't we just turn the other cheek? Everybody just said, shut your dumb ass up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, shut your dumb ass up. We, 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 we say we are Christian. Crazy. 
We try to appear Christian. We try to promote Christianity. We have so many churches and all that stuff, but we ain't no Christians. The same as the same as these uh th th these pastors. Everybody know, especially in the South, Black South. Everybody know these pastors is messing with uh, a bunch of these women, a bunch of bunch of bunch of the wives of of the of the men who who ain't showing up. They know this, right? The pastors are doing this stuff, and then we 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 people like man, the pastors are not so innocent. Duh. The whole thing is just to appear devout, so that you could get you could get the punani or whatever. So you get the goods, you get the resources, you get the you get you get whatever you the GTD, get the drugs. You already know. Already know, get the drugs, right? Uh, men usually judge things by the eye rather than by the hand. Everybody gets to see, but few come in touch, okay? Everyone sees what you appear to be, but few feel what you are. And those few don't have the courage to stand up against the majority opinion, which is backed by the majesty of the state. And everybody is backed by the majesty. Uh, uh, sorry, everybody's actions, especially those of princes for whom there is no court of appeal, are judged by their results. Okay. Uh, let me see. Have the courage to stand up against the majority of opinion, which is backed by the majesty of the tank. All right. So just to make sure that this elegant paragraph is understood, Machiavelli is using the eyes, hands, or seeing and feeling contrast as a metaphor for appearance and reality distinction. Yeah, everybody know that, man. Anyway, so yo, this translator, man. I'm like, yo, uh, this translator. All right. So let the prince conquer and hold this state. His means for this will always be regarded as honorable, and he'll be praised by everybody. Why? Because the common people are always impressed by appearances and outcomes, and the world contains only common people. There are a few others, but they can't find a footing there. So, uh, when the many feel secure. So he says, how am I going to end the sentence? When the many feel secure. A second is when the majority in the government are at one, when the majority can point to the prince's success, so long as the majority have any ground at all for their opinion. So a certain prince of the present time, I had better not name him, it was King Ferdinand of Spain, uh, preaches nothing but peace and trust, and is very hostile to both. And if he had ever practiced what he preaches, he would have lost his reputation and his kingdom many times over. So this is chapter 19. So how to avoid attracting contempt and hatred. And of course, remember, you have to go by your citizens. So you might be like, well, this white boy, uh, he hates us and blah, 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 blah. It's about who are your citizens. Okay? Who are your citizens? Because... When, when the white boy was enslaving Africans, you weren't his citizens. You understand? You weren't his citizens. You were the property of his citizens. Okay? He didn't have to impress the property of his citizens just like he didn't have to impress the cows and the cattle. You understand? Like, like, like you just don't understand what the system was in place. What he reduced you to. You weren't citizens. The chapter is supposed to deal implicitly with items 5 to 11 of the list, though only three are separately mentioned. The excellent verb to contemn, I don't know what that means, which is used here, means to have contempt for. Okay, so, having spoken of the more important qualities in my list, I want now to briefly to deal briefly with the others by bringing them under a general point that I have already touched on. Namely, a prince must be careful to avoid anything that will bring hatred or contempt down on him. If he succeeds in that, he'll have played his part and won't have any reason to see danger and criticism of his conduct. What would most get him hated, I repeat, is his being a grabber, a thief of his subject's property and women. He mustn't do that. Most men live contentedly as long as their property and their honor are untouched. So the prince will have to contend only with an ambitious minority and there are plenty of ways of easily dealing with them. A prince will be contemned if he is regarded as variable, frivolous, effeminate and cowardly, irresolute, and the prince should steer away from all of these as though they were a reef on which the ship of state could be wrecked. He should try to show in his uh, actions greatness of courage, seriousness, and fortitude, and in his private dealings with his subjects, his judgment should be irrevocable, and his standing should be such that no one would dream of trying to cheat or outwit him. And actually, you know, I, I, this is actually something that I should, this is frivolous, 
versus Sirius, that's actually something that I kind of uh, battle with. Because, you know, sometimes you, you hear me, and I'm joking, and I'm blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you're like, man, this guy's not too serious. You know? And that, that's like, I, I mean, that's, that's actually one of my flaws, to be honest. You know, one time, I, I told you guys a story. I'll tell you guys a story about one time I stopped this dude from raping a woman. You know? This woman came in drunk, and and these, and these white boys was there, and they were just like, well, basically, this is a sister and a brother, right? And the brother, you know, his brother, a black brother, he was about to rape the sister. Like, this white girl brought him in, brought her in, drunk as a skunk, drunk, you know, to get raped. And then I had to, and I saw that these white boys that were there, his roommates, his friends, were sitting by like, oh, you're going to rape this girl. And I was like, nah, I ain't going to have that. So I got up, and I was like, bro, you know, bro, you can't do this, okay? Right? You know... You know, and, and, you know, I spoke to him. And he was like, but aren't you, you always joking and you're not too serious. And now all of a sudden you're serious and all that stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's how it is. You know, like, like I know how to turn it on and turn it off. But it's like, 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 but it's not a good quality of mine. You know, it's not a good quality of mine. So I might, I might, I might I, like, 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 like real talk. Because, you know, I do think back to that time. And I'm just like, you know, I shouldn't have a reputation for joking. But I mean, sometimes it's like, but like, I don't really have a stake in my hand anyway. So it's not like. I got to be that serious. You see what I'm saying? But all the same. Like, you know, even when you say my voice is going to be doing on this podcast, it's like, okay, you know, it is what it is. All right. So a prince who conveys this impression of himself will be highly respected, and that will make him hard to conspire against internally and hard to attack from the outside, as long as he is known to be an excellent man who is respected by his people. So a prince ought to have two main words. And that's what I'm saying about, so George Washington, you know, uh, he was like that, like, 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 everybody was like, oh, what an honest guy, what a good guy, what a this, that, so forth. Meanwhile, he's, he's pulling teeth out of the mouth of black people and putting it in his mouth so that he could eat food. Like, he was, he was gross, he was disgusted, but the, 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 the propaganda machine was like, oh no, he's a respectable dude. You understand? So a prince ought to have two main worries, one internal concerning his subjects and the other external concerning foreign powers, Right? He can defend himself against foreign powers by being well armed and having good allies. If he's well armed, he will have good allies, right? A prince can easily secure himself against internal conspiracies against him by avoiding being hated and contemned and keeping the people satisfied with him. Conspirators always expect that killing the prince will be popular. When they learn that it would be unpopular, they'll lose heart and give up because conspiracies are hard enough to pull off anyway. History presents us with many conspiracies, but few successful ones. The reason for the high rate of failure is this. Someone plotting a coup against a prince can't act alone. He has to select a few has a fe- fellow conspirators, people he believes to be dissatisfied with the status quo. And by revealing your plan to such a malcontent, you put him in a position to become very contented without you. Uh, because he can expect great rewards for denouncing you. When he sees a certain gain from turning you in, and a great certainty about what good will come to him from joining your conspiracy... He'll turn you in unless he is an amazingly good friend to you or a passionate enemy to the prince. Right to summarize, on the conspirator's side, there is nothing but fear, jealousy, and the terrifying prospect of punishment. On the prince side, there is the majesty of his rank, the laws, and the protection of his friends and the state. Add to these factors the goodwill of the people, and it's almost impossible that anyone should be so rash as to conspire against the prince. Conspirators usually have the fear that something will prevent them from going through with their plot. But in this case, where the people are on good terms with the prince, the conspirators always has a fear of what may happen after the crime because the people will be hostile to him and wouldn't give him shelter. So, you know, this is like the example of like, you know, like for instance, you know, in the, in the United States, there's like, there's like somebody made a plot against, the plot of kidnapping the governor, a black governor, right? Somebody get, somebody put them in. Like, like they didn't even get close to the governor. You understand? They didn't even get close to the governor. And it's the same with like you know people might have been like oh I don't we we want to we want to get oh you know we want to get the pre- you know whatever right uh, I'm talking about like Obama and them right it's like you don't even, you don't, you know you don't even say it because somebody gonna get give you in you understand somebody gonna give you like like like, like, like these people survive their terms let's say with the exception of like three presidents in America uh, like they survived their terms you know. And, and, and I think the yeah 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 but but I mean like in the in the in the circumstances that they did it you know because like when you think about like it was JFK and well I only know I think there's three of them but I know I remember two of them which was JFK and Abraham Lincoln both of them was just trying to help out black folk 
<laughs> yeah, you are you doing the wrong thing if you're in America trying to have a black folk. I'm just letting you know. Uh, especially if you white, okay? All right. Anyway, so all the countless examples of this, and uh, hopefully y'all heard that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the countless examples, all the countless examples of this could be given. I uh, and by the way, I look like I'm going to take a long time on this. Okay, I look like I'm going to take a long time. But all right, all the countless examples of this could be given. I select just one which our fathers might actually remember, Annabelle Bentivaglio, who was prince in Bologna, uh, was murdered by the Kaneshesh in 1445. The only one of his family who survived was an infant, Giovanni. Immediately after the assassination, the people rose and murdered all the Kaneshi. Okay? Uh, this came from the popularity that the Bentivaglio family enjoyed in those days in the Bologna. Bologna. It was so great that although after Annabelle's death there was no... Bentivagi left who could rule the state. The Bolognese uh, heard about a Bentivigo in Florence who was until then had been thought to be the son of a blacksmith, sent to Florence for him and gave him the government of their city. He held it under until Giovanni was old enough to take over. Can you imagine that? They was like, oh, we're going to get, you know, this distant relative <coughs> because, you know, they're the rightful rulers. You know? Uh, the lesson I draw from them this is that the prince shouldn't worry much about conspiracies against him as the people are well disposed toward him because if they are hostile to him and hate him he should fear everything and everyone well-ordered states and wise princes have taken every care not to drive the nobles to desperation and to keep the common people satisfied and contented this is one of the prince's most important tasks france is currently well ordered and well governed the french king the french king's liberty and security depend on countless and see what i'm saying like again we go back to the property uh the thing you know abraham lincoln jfk they're trying to help out black folk they making the people the white commoners dissatisfied. You understand? Like a lot of times you say to yourself, why are the Democrats trying to appeal to the conservatives? Because if the conservatives are dissatisfied, they will come for you. You no longer have the protection of white people. You understand? Because uh, 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 essentially white folk are tr trying to exist in a country that suppresses and oppresses black folk. They, they, that's what they want. That's what they came here for. You know what I'm well, that's not really came for you for, but they they realize it's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a decent thing for them. All right, France is currently well ordered and well governed. The French king's liberty and security depends on countless good institutions that the French have. The most important of which is Parliament and its authority. The men who set up the system, knowing the ambition and arrogance of the nobility, thought they needed a bit in their mouth to rein them in. And on the other hand, knowing how much the common people hated and feared the nobles, wanted to do something to protect them. A reference to Louis the Ninth who apparently instituted the Parliament of Paris about 1254, his grandson, Philip the Fair, clarified and defined its function. But he didn't want either side of this to be the king's job because he didn't want to be blamed by the noble for favoring the people or by the people for favoring the nobles. So he set up a third party, an arbitrator, a parliament, which could hold back the nobles and favor the common people without bringing criticism down on the king. This has proven to be an excellent prudent way of protecting the security of the king and the kingdom. The lesson we can learn from this is that the prince ought to leave unpopular policies to be influenced by others and keep in their own hands any that will be accepted with gratitude. A likely objection to that would be I've been saying is this. Look at the lives and deaths of the Roman Empire. Some of them lived nobly and showed great virtue of spirit, yet they lost the empire or were killed by subjects who conspired against them. I shall respond to this by recalling the character of some of the emperors in question, showing that the cause of their downfall were not inconsistent with what I have been saying. In arguing for this, I'll confine myself to the period 161 to 238 BCE, during which the Roman Empire was ruled by the continuous series of emperors. Marcus, philosopher known as Marcus Aurelius, his son, Commodus, uh, Pertinix, Julian, Septimus Severus, the, uh, his son, Antonio Carcar, whatever, Macarius, blah, 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 Alexander Severus, and Maximus. The first thing to note is that whereas in other states the prince had only to deal with the ambitions of the nobles and the insolence of the common people, the Roman empires had a third problem, created by the cruelty and greed of their soldiers. It wasn't easy to satisfy both. Uh, <clears throat> both the common people who loved peace and were drawn to ambi unambitious princes, and the soldiers who were drawn to princes who were both cruel, bold, cruel, and rapacious, and were quietly, quite willing for a prince to exercise their qualities against the common people, so that they they could double their income by adding loot to their regular pay and giving vent to their own greed and cruelty. This problem was so hard that many emperors were brought down by it. 
Specifically, emperors who weren't naturally authoritative and weren't trained in authority were overthrown. What usually happened, especially with newcomers to the role of prince, was this. They saw the difficulty posed by the two opposing attitudes and tried to satisfy the soldiers and not worry about whether harm, wh whatever harm this was doing to the people. They had to do this. Princes might try to avoid being hated by anyone, but when they discover, as of course they, they will, that this is more than they can manage, they should work really hard to avoid the hatred of the group they have that has the most power. That is why emperors who had a special need for favorable support, because they were new to this, turned to the army rather than to the people. How well this worked out for each prince depended on whether he knew how to keep the army's respect. That's why Pertinax and Alexander Severus, being men of modest life, lovers of justice, enemies to... Be... And look, I just want to point this out. This is why, this is why white folk go for the police. Okay? Or, or the military, too. But this is why they go for the police, because the police is still more strong uh, than the uh, and the people. So that's why Pernax and Alexander Severus, being men of modest life, lovers of justice, enemies to cruelty, humane and benignant, both came to a sad end. Because like, I, I want to actually highlight this, too, because it's like, even when we talk about, well, because at this moment, Donald Trump decides to not concede his election and therefore not help out the transition, all that kind of blah, 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 blah. Right? So people are like, well, we just waited for him to get his, black, his, his white ass dragged out of the White House. Okay? But if he got the Secret Service on his side, it's not going to happen. So who's going to drag him out? You understand? Now, of course, he don't have the Secret Service on his side, but if he did, if he does or if he did, right? Who's going to drag him out? You? You going to drag him out? All right. Then. So that's why emperors... Were, oh, yeah, sorry. That's why Pertinax and Alexander Severus being men of modest life, lovers of justice. Uh, oh, wait, let me see. Terry Knott says, I think if enough of our people know the truth, they might want to fight, but again, we have been crippled to fear the system. Absolutely. You know, we've been crippled to fear the system. Facts. All right, so that's why uh, Marcus was equally excellent as a uh, person and was honored throughout his life. That was because he had succeeded to the throne by hereditary right with no help from the army or the people. And afterward, the respect he got because his great virtue enabled him to keep both groups in their place without being hated or contemned by either. But Pertinax, right, who's obviously not a child, was created emperor against the wishes of the soldiers, who having become used to the laxity of discipline under Commodus, the second one, couldn't bear the proper discipline that Pertinax wanted to inflict on them. Thus, having given cause for hatred with contempt for his old age thrown in, he was overthrown, killed, near the start of his reign. Notice that hatred is acquired as much by good works as by bad ones. Now for Alexander Severus, right, who was such a good man that many praises were lavished on him, including this. In his 14 years as emperor, he never had anyone executed without a trial. <coughs> That's good. All right, still, he was regarded as effeminate and as being under his mother's thumb. He came to be held in contempt, and the army conspired against him and murdered him. The characters of Commodus, Septorus, Severus, uh, Antonius, Caracalla, and Maximus are on the other hand, end of the scale. They were all extremely cruel and rapacious, men who set no limit to how much they can harm the people in order to satisfy their soldiers. And all of them, except Septorus, Severus, uh, came to a bad end. He had so much virtue that he could keep the army on his side, although he oppressed the people, and he had a successful 18-year reign. His virtue made him remarkable in the eyes of the soldiers who were respectful and satisfied, and of the people who were numb with astonishment. This man's achievements were impressive, given that he was a new prince, and I want to give a brief sketch of how good he was at imitating the fox and the lion, which I said earlier, uh, a prince has to be able to do. So at the time when Pertinax was killed by his Praetorian guard, Septimus Severus was in command of an army in Slavonia, uh, approximately Croatia. Knowing that the Emperor Julian, Pertinax's successor on the throne, he brought his election as emperor from the uh, soldiers of the palace ground, <coughs> was feeble and indecisive. Uh, he bought his election. Feeble and indecisive, Severus convinced his army that it would be right to go to Rome and avenge Pertinax's death. Under this pretext, and without revealing any ambition to become emperor himself, he got his army to Rome. Moving so fast that he uh, reached Italy before it was known that he had left Slavonia. On his arrival at Rome, the frightened Senate elected him set emperor and had Julian killed. Pertinax had reigned for three months, Julian for two. Severus now confronted two obstacles to his becoming master of the whole Roman Empire. One in Asia, <coughs> where Niger, imagine that, Niger, commanded the Asiatic army, uh, had had himself proclaimed emperor when Pertinax was murdered. The other in the west, where Albinus, also at the head of an army, aimed to become emperor. Thinking it would be too risky to declare himself hostile to both, Severus decided to attack Niger and deceive Albinus. 
He wrote to Alvin of saying that he having him being elected emperor by the Senate, he was willing to share that dignity with Albinus as co emperor, and that the Senate had agreed to this, and he gave Albinus the title Caesar. Albinus believed all this. But after Septimus Severus had conquered and killed Niger and calmed things down in the east, he returned to Rome and complained to the Senate that Albinus, instead of being grateful for the benefits Severus had given him, had treacherously tried to murder him. For this ingratitude, he told the Senate, he had no option but to punish him. Then he hunted Albinus down in France and took from him his authority and his life. So you see what I'm saying? Like, he was like, oh, <coughs> this is before the digital age, obviously. So what he was like was like, oh, y'all tried to y'all tried to get me. You know what I mean? Like, like no, he was like, oh, oh. Like, he's not trying to fight two fronts. He's not trying to fight two battles at the same time. You know? So he says, oh, I'm going to fight one and say that the other one's my ally. And a matter of fact, I should tell y'all this. That This is what happened to me the other day. I was walking, and this white boy was walking in front of me, and he was just talking geopolitics he was like oh america i think he was talking about uh how how oh i think i think at one point he's like you know if trump really wanted to like like they take over the country he would just bomb like like well he didn't say a black city but he just said like philadelphia or something but he was like he could just drop a bomb and be like what you gonna do now right this is what was saying and he's like the only thing that could uh he's like oh but then this war could happen and if if war happened you know if france and no, he said and russia and china tried to fight america like, like they would win, you know that kind of stuff, you know. But, but America would probably beat each of them, you know, in a one on one. So I mean, I mean, you know, of course, you know, it was just weird that this white boy was just talking geopolitics like on the phone with somebody, you know, whatever. But on the other hand, it's 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 relevant in the sense of, you know, this is this is this is the history of, of white folk where they're like, look, we got two people coming after this one throne. So you go to one and you say, oh, you know, well we could we could co-rule. And the other one, you say, oh, you, you're going to die. And then after you get rid of one of them and you settle and you rebuild yourself, you kill the other guy who's your co-ruler. You understand? Like, like that, 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 that's what it is. Now, now I'm not advising you to, to be that way, right? I'm not advising you to be that way, but, you know, you because, know, I mean, I, I know some of y'all are going to be like, oh, Arnie, let's co-rule together. <laughs> and I'll be like, wait a second. Oh, you you read you read the prince you know what I'm saying <laughs> but uh you know you read the president or you read the next suit that's what I want to know well, all right let's see Tag Nine says our people don't know their true history and they are repeating its mistakes once we learn the ways of the Europeans I think our chances will be greater than the current state we are in absolutely you know I almost feel like writing that book you know on the ways of the European you know the ways of Wazungu you know. Uh, because, you know, if, they, if they're giving it away, but the thing is that we're not reading, I feel like I should probably make it a documentary, honestly, you know, I feel like I should probably make it a documentary, but, you know, it is what it is, so anyway, anyone who looks carefully at this man's actions will see that he was a very ferocious lion and a most cunning fox, feared and respected by everyone and not hated by the army, it's not surprising that he, a newcomer to the throne, rather than having been educated for it, as their heir apparent, was able to hold on to power so well, his immense prestige always protected him from the hatred that the people might have had for him because of his violence and greed. His son, Antonius Carcala, was an eminent man with excellent qualities which made the people admire him and the soldiers accept him. More than just accept him, indeed, he was a hardened warrior who never got tired and despised all delicate food and other luxuries, but the soldiers loved him. Yet his ferocity and cruelties were enormous, far beyond anything people had known before, so that after countless single murders, he had a large number of the people of Rome killed and the entire population of Alexandria. He came to be hated by the whole world and also feared by those he had around him. Look at that. The guy kills off a whole city. Alexandria. He kills off a whole city. Like, he's just cruel, 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 right? He came to be hated by the whole world and also feared by those he had around him, so much that a centurion murdered him in the midst of his soldiers. It's uh, important to understand that a prince can't protect himself against this sort of, that sort of murder planned by a determined mind because anyone can kill a prince if he doesn't mind dying himself. Still, a prince doesn't have to be much in fear of such an assassination because they're, they're very rare. He does have... See what I'm saying? Like, he's talking about assassins. So that's what I was talking about when I talked about... Uh, like, uh, more so than conspiracies, but like an assassin. Uh, like, he's like, anybody could... Like, so you have assassins. Assassins are a real thing. Like, if you don't mind dying... And that's the thing, though, too. It's like... There was this assassin that came for, like they were saying it was surrounding that uh, that white boy, you know, the the one with the perv island, or the pedophile island, or whatever. But like he came for the judge, and apparently he, like a lot of these assassins kill themselves after. Like 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 they take on contracts, like yeah, we're gonna kill somebody. Like if you're not worried about yourself dying, right? Then then yeah, you know, there's a lot of people like that. They they don't care if they, you know, like you don't know if the suicide hotline. 
There are people recruiting for assassins. Be like, hey, wait, before you kill yourself, you know, don't don't you think you want to make the world a little better place before you do that? Like, I don't know. That's that's, that's a good ass thing. I might I might actually take up a phone call like that. You know, if I hear some brother calling, you know, I'm like, yeah, man, but you think, don't you think these are yeah <laughs> shit? I might start a suicide hotline. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh catch me. Uh, catch me outside, right? <laughs> all right. Well, right. Terry says, but the result is always the same. The result is always the same because we don't, we don't know. It's like, if you don't know your enemy, how do you expect to win? Well, that makes sense. You know, it's, it's like, it's like if, I'm, if I'm out to go fight somebody, okay, and I don't know their fighting tactics, right? Like, sure, I mean, if I'm a good fighter, maybe I can still stand a chance. But if I know that they are a grappler, right? If I know that they're a grappler, I know what to carry with me. If I know that they are a shooter, okay? If I know they're a shooter, you know? If I know that they aren't and dangerous, right? And I'm coming with my fist fight. It's like, it's like this one time. I was sitting down with my ex, right? And then these kids were uh, trying to harass us. You know, I said something. I shouted out something. And I guess they thought I said something related to their gang or something. I don't know. They started harassing. So I was like, I'm about to go beat their ass because they're kids. But my, my ex-wife was like, no, 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 you don't know if they have a gun or not, you know? And, of course, I still was like, I'm not going to lose a fight against a no, no motherfucking kid anyway. But luckily, they pulled their fit. Like, like, only one, like, it was three of them, only one of them was really aggressive. And they and, they, and his friends were like, nah, let's just walk away. He wasn't blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, you know, shit, y'all better walk. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, you don't know. You don't, if you, if you don't, if you, like, if I go and rush these kids... And they like armed, like they they got rifles or some shit. Not rifles, but you know they got handguns or something, right? I'll be wasted, right? Particularly if I'm not armed, right? Or, or or even this, let's say they not armed, and then I pull out a gun on these children, and just shoot children on the streets. I'm going to prison. You know what I'm saying? Now it's different if they armed and they pull and they about to pull out and not just do do do, right? That's different, right? But, 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 but that's why you have to know what your enemy is up to, what your enemy has, right? But let, let's, let's keep going. Uh, let's keep going. So, uh, he says he doesn't have to take care to not give any grave injury to any of his servants or those around him in the service of the state, which is just what Caracalla did. He had ashamedly put to death a brother of that centurion and had continually threatened the centurion himself, yet he kept him in his bodyguard. Look at that. It was a rash thing to do and prove the emperor's ruin. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. He, was he, he killed his bodyguard's brother and threatened his bodyguard. Like, yo, man, shut the fuck. Like, shut up, man. I don't give a shit. Yo, I'll kill you. I'll kill your mama, too. I'll kill your mama next, he said. You know what I'm saying? So the centurion was like, shit. Well, I mean, look, you probably going to kill me anyway. So I'm going to get you first. That's how it is sometimes. So let, let's turn now to Kamadas. It should have been very easy. For, and this is what I'm saying. Even though because he's in Italy, so that's probably why he's studying Rome. Because if y'all don't know, Rome and Italy like the same nation, right? Uh, uh, like Rome right now is a city in Italy. <laughs> you feel me? But but here's the thing. He's, he's So part of it is he's going to his history. But another part of it is that the history has his lessons. You see? Because he, he'd also talk about Greece too, but... As a matter of fact, I think I see right here, Egyptian right here. But anyway, all right. <coughs> Let us now turn to Commodus. It should have been very easy for him to hold on to power because as a son of Marcus Aurelius, he had inherited it. All he needed to do was please his soldiers and the people was to follow in his father's footsteps. But he was cruel, bestially so, and freed himself to steal from the people by currying favor with the soldiers and letting military discipline collapse. And eventually the soldiers came to contemn him. He had no sense of the dignity of his position, often showed up in the amphitheater to compete with gladiators, and did other sordid things that weren't worthy of the imperial majesty. So he came to be hated by the people and despised by the army and fell victim to the conspiracy to murder. This man was in the, he was fighting the gladiators himself. That's crazy. All right. It remains to discuss the character of Maximinus. Uh, Maximinus, uh, Maximinus, see, Maximinus, isn't this crazy? All right. He was extremely warlike, and the armies, being disgusted with the effeminacy of Alexander, killed him and elected Maximus to the, uh, Maximinus to the throne. He didn't keep it for long because, for, because, wait, for, because two things, because two things brought hatred and contempt down on him. Uh, everyone knew about his lowly background. He had been a mere uh, shepherd in Thrace. When he became emperor, he didn't go to Rome to be formally installed. Right? All right, sorry. Let me see. 
Everyone knew about his lowly background. He was been a mere shepherd in Thrace. When he became emperor, he didn't go to Rome to be formally installed. He had his prefects in Rome and everywhere and elsewhere do many cruel things, which earned him a reputation for the utmost ferocity. Uh, so everyone was outraged by his peasant origin and afraid of his barbarity. First Africa rebelled, then the Senate with all of the people of Rome and all Italy conspired against him. His army too. Uh, they were besieging Aquilia and running into difficulties. They were disgusted with his cruelties. And when they found that he had so many enemies, they were emboldened to kill him. You know, I don't want to discuss Heliograpus and Macrinus and Ju or Julian. They were all contemptible, didn't last long, and were quickly wiped out. And I want to get finished with this topic. I'll just say this. It's not nearly as hard for princes today to make their soldiers very satisfied with them. They do have to make some concessions to them, but that... The unrest of the army and its cure doesn't last long. None of the, today's princes have armies with long experiences of controlling and administering provinces as are the armies of the Roman Empire. Back then, satisfying the army had precedence over satisfying the people, whereas now for all the princes except the Turkish and Egyptian sultans, uh, satisfying the people's outranks satisfying the army because the people are the more powerful. Machiavelli goes on to explain why these sultans are an exception. Then, so he didn't even go into it, but yeah, apparently Egypt and Turkey. All right. Uh, when returning to my topic, what I have written shows that what brought down each of the emperors was hatred or contempt and shows how it came about that the next bit is highly compressed. When it comes down to is this, of the seven emperors Machiavelli has discussed, three approached the emperor's role in one way, called it gentle, and four in a different way, called it rough. Each approach led to just one good upshot. Here's what Machiavelli has in mind. Gentle and successful of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, gentle and unsuccessful were these. Uh, rough and successful was Septus, Severus, so on and so forth. These leads five failures for Machiavelli to explain, and he does so, being because Pertinax and Alexander were new princes, it was useless and dangerous for them to model themselves on Marcus Aurelius, who had inherited his position as prince, and it was utterly destructive to Commodus, Caraculus, and Maximus to intimidate Septus Severus because they didn't have enough virtue to enable them to tread in his footsteps. So a new prince can't imitate the actions of Marcus, but doesn't have to take Septus Severus as a model either. What he should do is to take them from Severus, the course of action that are necessary to found a state, and from Marcus, the ones that bring glory to a state that is already stable and firm. So now it's chapter 20, are fortresses and other princely devices advantageous or hurtful? All right? Now you think about that. So princes wanting to make their state secure have variously uh, disarmed their subjects. All right. Uh, let's see if we let's see if we you guys hear me. All right. Have variously disarmed their subjects, encouraged factions in their subjects' town, fostered hostilities against themselves, set out to win over those whom they distrusted at the start of their reign, build fortresses and destroyed fortresses. Okay. So a final judgment on these things can only be made in the light of the particular facts regarding each state, but I will discuss this matter as comprehensively as the topic permits. 1. No new prince has ever disarmed his subjects. Rather, when any new prince has found the people unarmed, he has armed them. Why? Because by arming them, you make them ar those arms yours. The men whom you distrusted become loyal, and those who are already loyal remain so, and your subjects become your supporters. Not all the subjects can be armed, and those who are armed are receiving a privilege. But this won't get you into any trouble with the others. They will understand that the armed men are bound to you, are likely to put in, are likely to be put in harm's way on your behalf, and so deserve a greater reward. And they won't hold it against you that you gave, given that you have given some, and not others this privilege. See, everybody has typos. You have given some. Everybody has typos. So don't don't get on me about typos. But when you disarm your subjects, you at once offend them by giving evidence that you are either cowardly or naturally distrustful, and either of those opinions will make you hated. And since you can't survive without some army, and since you have disarmed your subjects, you have to turn to mercenaries. And I've already shown in chapter 12 what they are like. And if you had good mercenaries, they won't be enough to defend you against powerful enemies and subjects whom you don't trust. So, I repeat, new princes and new principalities have always distributed arms among their subjects. And, of course, that means making police, that means making an army, 
Okay? That also means, you know, I mean, yeah, that, that's what it means, actually. All right. So, number two. Generations ago, the experts used to say that Pistoia can only be held by factions and Pisa only by fortresses. And this idea, or a generalized version of it, led them to foment quarrels in some of their tribunal towns so as to make them easier to dominate. Back then, when they were as a kind of balance of power in Italy, this may have been a f- sound enough policy, but I don't think it's acceptable today because I don't think that now factions can ever be of use. Can ever be of use. On the contrary, when a city divided by factions is attacked from the outside, it will quickly be lost because the weaker faction will always have the external attacker and the others won't be able to resist. I think the Venetians were following this policy when they stirred up trouble between the Guelph Gu- and the Ghibelline uh, factions in their subject cities. Without letting the trouble come to bloodshed, they encouraged these disputes so that the citizens wouldn't unite against them, the Venetians. We saw that this doesn't work out in the way they expected, because after the Venetians' defeat at Vilea in 1509, one of the two factions took courage and seized the state. A prince's following this policy shows that he is weak because the factional quarrels won't be permitted in any rigorous principality. In times of peace, it is a policy for managing subjects, but in times of war, it is sheer folly. Some of y'all, all right, so this is something you're not even getting. Encourage faction in their subject towns. Oh! Like, you don't even know what this... this this right here is a divide and conquer. Okay? Like, like the way how I just read that, you probably wouldn't get Because even when I was reading that, I was just like, I don't know what he's really saying. Right? But then I was like, oh, wait, this is divide and conquer. But it's so, it's so obscure, it's so written, it's written so unclearly that you're not going to catch it. But, this is what happened on the continent of Africa. Okay? We have factions. So one faction would side with the enemy. Okay, like for instance, even even when you talk about uh, Nzinga, she had the Dutch on her side against the Portuguese. You understand? But then at the same time, like 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 again, like I say, Bob Askenau, he pointed out, he like, but you know, she might have been selling uh, enslaved Africans or selling you know her captives to the Dutch, her allies. So she, even though she didn't want slavery, you know, even though she didn't like the Portuguese and all that. You know she was trying to not have slavery in her community. Like, like you couldn't, you couldn't avoid it. That's the faction. The, the, the thing. This is why we talk about Pan Africanism. Pan Africanism is the erasure of factions. We don't need those factions. And a lot of you are like, we want to hold on to our factions. You know, and of course, you know, you call them tribes and ethnicities. Okay, we want to hold on to our tribes. We want to hold on to our ethnicities. You're trying to erase us. I do not want you to ally with our enemy. That's what I don't want. That's it. I don't care what you doing. I don't care if you have a taboo. I don't care if you if you want to, you know, dress this way or that way. I don't I don't care. I don't care if you want to play this type of song. I don't care if you want to use this type of instrument. I don't care if you want to eat this or that. I'm saying that if we are going to war, you do not you're not on the wrong side. That's all I care about. I'm not coming for your culture. I'm coming for your war habits. Get that through your head. And I tell you, some of y'all, look, look I hope, hope y'all get some other people listening. I mean, I know this is a long podcast. I'm sorry for that. Okay? I'm not, I'm sorry, not sorry. You know? Sorry, not sorry. Because I think, I think this is important. All right? I'm not important, important like, oh, crackers got something important to say. But I think it's important in the sense of, 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 you know, get over it. Okay, like <laughs> get over it, you know. Uh, all right, let's go. Number three, there's no doubt that a prince becomes great when he overcomes difficulties and obstacles. For this reason, when a fortuna wants greatness to come to a new prince who needs a personal reputation more than an hereditary prince does, it causes enemies to arise and turn them against him. This gives him the opportunity to overcome them, climbing higher on this ladder than his enemies have brought to him. That's why many people think that as a wise prince should, when the opportunity presents itself, engineer some hostility against himself so that he can crush it and thus elevate his level of fame. Uh, four, princes, especially new ones, have often received more loyalty and support from men they had distrusted at the outset than from those whom they had trusted. Pandolfo Petrucci, prince of Siena, governed the state with more help uh, from those he had initially distrusted than from others. No other historian records this judgment. Machiavelli can scarcely have been unaware that the Medici, to whom he was addressing this book, did not much trust him. Okay. (laughs) 
but one can't generalize on this topic because individual cases vary so much. I'll just say this. Men who have been hostile at the start of a principality and who don't have the rank or status needed to support themselves without help can easily be won over by the prince. They'll be strongly bound to serve him loyally because they'll know how important it is to them to act in a way that will cancel the bad impression he has formed of them. So the prince always gets better value from them than from men who serve him neglectfully because they are so sure of their position with him. And that's what I'm saying. That's what happened. In fact, that actually happened in my, in my, in, in my Discord. You know, there were people that like, 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 like. Sometimes you got to be harsh with the people in your Discord, okay? Because sometimes they're like, oh well, you know, this person. Like sometimes that's what happens. When, like when you organizing, okay? When you organizing, you got people around you, right? And they're like, like let's say we organizing, you and me organizing, right? Oh, actually, I don't even know the example. I, I'm going to try to see if there's an example that I can remember. But yeah, all right. Basically, if me and you organizing and we seem like we cool, right? You might feel that you could done disrespect me or something. Okay? You might feel like you could done disrespect me because you're like, oh, he ain't going nowhere. Right? Or, or even this. You know, some people might be like, hey, I could disrespect you because, you know, like that happens to me sometimes. You'd be like, hey, I could disrespect you any which way I want because you ain't gone. Like, you need me. It's like, no, I don't need you. You understand? Like, like, like you gotta, like, if people feel like they need it, right, they gonna be trouble. Now, if people need you, that's a difference. You know, if people know that they need you, that's a difference. So, so when you in Africa, that's, that's what happens, man. That's, 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 that's why people are loyal to America, because they know they need America. Especially for their, for their, for their, for their, uh, for their, the quality of life that they're looking for. You know? Because I tell you, one time I was there, out there, and I was like, you know, we don't even need these, uh, like, if we had land, we could have our own thing. He's like, if we had land and all that, how would we, how would we eat? Like, like, how would we do that? I'm like, man, if you got land, you got trees, you could just pick the fruit off the tree or something. He goes, I ain't doing that. You know what I mean? Like, if I go to the grocery store, why would I pick off fruit off a tree? And it's like, to me, it was like, what are you talking about? You sound like a lazy mother. But, like, it also makes sense that he understands that in the time of a, of a, of a, of a, like, 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 like for instance, if you, you know about how these, these riots, I, I want to go back to these riots. You know that when a riot happens, right, that all the, like, like if, if they clear out all the stuff in Walmart, how you going to get your, how you going to do your shopping? How you going to buy a new pair of pants? This is, if they chase Walmart out of the, out of the neighborhood, how you going, how you going to buy a new pair of pants? You going to have to make it? You, you, you think you in America are going to be making pants? That, that's what you think you, you're doing? Uh, you gotta, you gotta know how to feel needed. So when we in Africa, we have to know how to feel needed. Okay, and that, this is why I say, I say all that works, works in works, n not in theory. Cause nobody's gonna need you in theory. They're gonna need you by the works that you do. You understand? And th th this is also like, like how you become rich. You know, like, th like uh, everybody who's rich is gonna tell you. Well, not everybody, but. A lot of people who become rich, like new money, right? They'll tell you. Part of the reason because they, they went after and did something that people needed. Like, 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 like Bill Gates was like, they need personal computers. I made it so that they needed personal computers. Dell, Dell was selling computers to schools because they were like, oh, if you're going to be in the modern age and you're going to teach kids, we go, you need a computer in your freaking school lab. Then, they, then the school has to pay, the school pays, uh, you know, three dollars a computer has twelve computers. No, no, twenty-four computers, 30, 30 computers, right? Three dollars a computer, thirty computers. Uh, that's nine thousand dollars, right? Wait, let me see. I said, I said thirty times three hundred, right? Yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, whatever. Nine thousand dollars, right? Now you talk about you talk about a whole school district with like let's say with like a hundred a uh, hundred schools, right? So that so that nine thousand dollars now becomes ninety thousand dollars, or or whatever, you know? Uh, oh, sorry, no, nine hundred thousand dollars, right? Almost a million dollars, right? Just, 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 just selling, 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 and that, that's, that's if the, 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 the computers are cheap. You understand? And then of course, you know, the, the teachers are all going to want a computer now, and you got all the brand, you know, a lot is going on. But the point is that you, you there making a bunch of money now, now, now you might be like, well, there's that thing now. Now you see me, I'm selling books that you feel like you don't need for some reason. Best books on the planet, you're like, I don't read those stuff. That's fine. But that, that's why I'm not rich. Now, if, if y'all thought, if, they, if people felt like they needed the books, if I was selling, you know, a thousand, you know, two thousand copies a, 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 a month, uh, you know I'd be rich. I'd be really rich. You understand? 
You you got you gotta go by need. The same with if you're trying to make a nation, you gotta go by need. So what with you if you if you're supposed to be needed, then you have to do what makes you need dead. This is some life this is some life lessons. And it's not it's not the book, it's me. But but you ain't listening. <laughs> you ain't listening. Drop another like for me if y'all like that. Alright, so anyway, let's see. I should warn any prince who has taken over a new state with the help of his inhabitants that he should think hard about the motives in helping them. About their motives in helping him. If they were motivated not by any natural affection for him, but only by discontent with their government, then he'll find it very hard to remain friends with them, because it will be impossible to make them contented with him. In the light of this reason for this, look at all the ancient and modern examples. You'll find it is easier for a prince to make friends of men who were contented under the former government and are therefore his enemies than of those who were con discontented with the government and wanted and enabled him to seize power. The seemingly strange opinion, which Megabelli really doesn't explain, makes sense if one thinks of as expect experienced civil servants and as now unemployed revolutionaries. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Uh, and actually, this white boy actually has it right for a second. You know, a broken clock makes it, uh, you know, right once a day or uh, whatever, or twice a day. Right? But it's like, it's like, if you, because like, like I said, you know, the example goes to, uh, I don't really like to drop names, but you, but basically there's this, there's this dictator in Africa, right? And there's this opposition and people in that country aren't even sure that the opposition would be a better leader, like better for the economy, better for this, better for that, better for trade, better for anything. They're not sure that the opposition is better. So again, you, you know, even though people want to, you know, get rid of the old government. They don't know if the new one's going to be better. That's why I tell you from the beginning, you have to emphasize the good laws, what happens after the war, what happens after the revolution. That's what people have to fall in love with. Okay? That's what people have to fall in love with. And maybe I might need to write another book on that, but that's what people need to do. Okay? They need to fall in love with the new government, the new Africa. Maybe that's what I need to be writing about. Okay? I don't know what I should be writing about, but I feel like that might just be it. But okay, let's keep going. Princes wanting to increase the security of their states have often built fortresses. A fortress can serve as a bridle and bit reining in potential enemies, and it's a place of refuge from a first attack. I praise this as a time-hollowed practice, yet in our time we have seen these events. Uh, Niccolo Vitelli demolished two fortresses in Cite de Villa at an aid to holding onto the town. Guaida Abaldo, the Duke of Urbino, drove Cesare Borgia out of his dominion and then flattened all the fortresses in that province, which he thought he, which he thought he uh, thought, sorry, which he thought he could hold more easily when the fortress is gone. And the Ben Tavigali retained power in Bologna and followed the same policy. When a fortress is useful, then depend on the circumstances. Uh, then depends on the circumstances. They help you in one way, they harm you in another. Here's a way of looking at this. A prince who is more afraid of his own people than of foreigners ought to build fortresses. But one who fears foreigners more than he does his people ought to do without them. Uh, the castle that Francesco Sforza has built in Milan has given the Sforza family more trouble than any of the state's other troubles, and it will go on doing so. The best people's possible fortress for a prince is not being hated by his people. If you have fortresses and your people hate you, the fortresses won't do you any good. An openly rebellious populace will have no shortage of foreigners wanting to come to their aid against you. No princes in our time have found fortresses to be useful to him, with the ex limited exception of the Countess of Forley. On the death of her husband, uh, Count Jerome, in 1488, her fortress enabled her to withstand the popular attack and wait for help from Milan, thus recovering her state. The circumstance at that time was such that no foreigners could help the rebellious people. The fortresses didn't do much for her in 1499 when Césaire Borgia attacked her and when her hostile people were allied with foreigners. At both those times, she'd have been better off having subjects who didn't hate her than she was with fortresses. All these things considered then, I'll praise any prince who builds fortresses as well as any who doesn't, and I'll blame any prince who doesn't mind being hated by his people because he is relying on his fortresses. Okay. So... Let's go to the next page. Uh, and thanks for the like. Whoever dropped that like, much appreciated. Right? Like, 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 Brother Koku was pointing out, you know, just helps the algorithm. You know, if you want, if you think there's something valuable here, right? Make it, make it, make it flourish. All right? I mean, I know it's taking a long time, but, you know, this, this is me actually actively reading the book to you. I could have just read it, 
told you about it later. Oh, snap. Y'all see Morish? All right. Anyway. But anyway, let's get going. What a prince should do to acquire prestige. So nothing builds a prince's prestige more than A, his undertaking great enterprises, and B, his setting a fine example by his personal conduct. A, we have in our time Ferdinand of Aragon, the present king of Spain. He can almost be called a new prince because his fame and glory have raised him from being an insignificant king to being the foremost king in the Christian world. At the start of his reign, look at this right here. In our time, so he's writing at the time of the Moors. You see that? I didn't even know that. I didn't even connect the dots. I mean, I should have connected the dots because the Moors were kicked out in 1491, right? Yeah, 1491, and he's writing in 15-something, okay? So at the start of his reign, he attacked Grenada, the Moorish kingdom in southern Spain, and this campaign laid the foundation of his power. He proceeded quietly at first with no worries about being interfered with. He kept the barons... He kept the barons... Uh... He kept the barons of Castile busy thinking about the war and not planning any changes inside Spain. And they didn't notice that by their means he was increasing his prestige and his power over them. He financed his army with money from the church and from taxes. And through that long war, he built a military establishment that has since brought him honor. Further, and look at it, he's going to say Jews. Further, under cover of religion, he embarked on greater schemes with pious cruelty hunting out the Jews in his kingdom and expelling them. A pitiful state of affairs brought about by an extraordinary act. Under the same religious cloak, he attacked Africa, invaded Italy, and now he attacked France. Thus, he has always planned and acted as a grandiose scale, keeping his subjects' minds in a state of amazement and anxiety about what was going to happen next. And his actions have followed one another so quickly that there has been, never been a quiet time in which men could work steadily against him. And this is actually important, too, right here. Look at this. Undertaking great enterprises. This is what you should be doing. You're not undertaking great enterprises. You you writing great tweet threats. No disrespect. All right. No disrespect to the to the people who write great tweet threats, though. You know what I'm saying? All right. B. A prince can be greatly helped by striking acts of government and internal affairs. King Ferdinand did well on this score also, and there's a striking example of it in the reported acts of Barnabo Visconti, Prince of Milan. Whenever any civilian did something extraordinary, whether good or bad, Barnabo would devise a reward or punishment that everyone talked about. A prince ought, above all, try to get through all his actions the reputation of being a great and remarkable man. A prince also gains prestige from being either a true friend or an outright enemy, i.e. says openly which side he favors in any conflict. This will always serve better than staying neutral. Here is why. Suppose that two of your powerful enemies are at war and you are wondering what to do. Either... Uh, one, the combatant's power level makes it the case that if you stay neutral, then the winner will be a threat to you. Or, two, their power level isn't as high as that. Right? This is some, uh, so he's saying, uh, yeah. So, the power level makes it the case that if you stay neutral, then the winner will be a threat. And otherwise, it's not. Right? So, under power level translates qualitia, which is ambiguous. But Machiavelli is thinking here purely in terms of power and not bringing in moral or psychological qualities or anything like that. You can see that in his assumption that either both combatants are scary or neither of them is. If their power levels were different, then they wouldn't be fighting. Uh, there will still be more evidence shortly. All right, so either way, you do best by not staying neutral, but rather picking a side and fighting hard for it, because in case you'll inevitably fall prey to the winner, and you'll have... Because in case one, you'll inevitably fall prey to the winner, and you'll have no excuse, no defense, and nowhere to hide, and how the loser in the conflict will enjoy this. Uh, neither side will befriend you, the winner won't want friends whom he can't depend on in times of trial, and the loser won't receive you because you didn't take sword in hand and share his danger with him. The word translated by receive seems to imply that there has always been a few lines before. As it's there as always a few lines before, and below, Machiavelli is thinking of the safety of the prince as an individual rather than a rescue for the state, his administration. Machiavelli illustrates this with an anecdote from ancient Greece, illustrating something that he goes on to say will always happen. Thus it will always happen that the one who isn't your friend will ask you to keep out of it, while your friend will ask you to fight on his side. Indecisive princes usually try to avoid immediate danger by taking the neutral route, and they are usually ruined by this choice. But when a prince briskly declares himself in favor of one side, if the side you choose is the winner, then you have a good friend who is indebted to you. It's true that the winner may be powerful enough to have you at his mercy, but he won't use that against you. If he did, there would be a monument of ingratitude, and men are never as low as that. And you could say a psych for that. You understand? Because look at this. How many times have black people fought for white folk? But again, the thing with this is that black folk have no... Uh, we'll use the term here. They have no prince. Okay? You're not a principality and you have no prince. Therefore, they don't owe you nothing. Because you were just the... Like, 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 like I always say. You were just the population in their nation. 
Okay? You're just, you're just people at their disposal. That's all you want. And that's, that's possibly what you're all, all you're going to be. Okay? Sorry. Victories are never so complete that the victor has no need to be careful about anything. No need especially to be careful about justice. But if the side you choose loses, he may receive same verb as above you and help you for as long as he can so that you become companions in fortuna that may rise again. So in the second case, when the power level of the combatants is such that you have nothing to fear from either, there's an even stronger prudential reason for you to choose a side. Why? Because the side you choose is certain to win. So that you're helping the destruction of one prince, X, with the help of another prince, Y, who, if he's had any sense, who has protected X against you, and Y, having with your assistance won a war <coughs> that he couldn't have won without you, is now at your mercy. And here I should point out, as a reproach to a prince, Y, that a prince should be careful never to make an alliance with a more powerful prince for the purpose of attacking others, unless circumstances force him into this. If he wins, you will be at his mercy, and prince should do everything they can to avoid being at anyone's mercy. Machiavelli gives two recent examples, the Venetians forming an alliance that led to the ruin, and the Florentines forming an alliance when they absolutely had to. He continues. So, this is why the book is a little shorter than uh, the 190 pages, because the dude kind of cuts it off, but that's okay. Because, I mean, I don't really care for those examples, to be honest. Uh, if you do care, obviously you go read the book, all right? No government should ever think that it can choose perfectly safe courses of action. Every government should expect to have run risks because in the ordinary course of events, one never tries to avoid one trouble without running into another. Prudence consists in knowing how to weigh up troubles and choose the lesser one. D. A prince ought also to show himself a patron of virtue and to honor those who are talented in any art or craft. And he should encourage the citizens to carry steadily on with their ordinary occupation in commerce, agriculture, and so on, so that no one is deterred from increasing his holding by the fear that they'll be confiscated or deterred from starting up businesses as a trader by fear of duties and taxes. Rather, the prince should create incentives for doing these things and for doing anything else that improves his city or state. Also, he should entertain the people with banquets and show at appropriate times of the year and as every city is divided into guilds or clans he should treat such bodies with respect so to come of their meeting so to some of their so go to some of their meetings and present himself as a model of courtesy and generosity though always maintaining the majesty of his rank which he must never allowed to be diminished so that's actually there's also right here you see the quote-unquote nation building part okay like you see like and that's the thing i also said in the video game so the video game i said before no the other game i was talking about the other day now i don't i don't really play a lot of games but uh, with, with, with the coronavirus and being indoors a lot, I, I kind of did <laughs> get a few. Right? I was just like, shit, you know? I ain't got nothing else to do. Uh, well, not that I have nothing else to do, but, you know, like, I got a lot more free time. A lot more home time. But anyway, uh, yeah, one of them was like, you, you host banquets. You, you do banquets. You meet with the, uh, you meet with other people of, 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 of high rank, quote unquote, other princes, if you will, you know? And you eventually become, uh, and you and you could make could do intrigue and all that kind of stuff. But like that's a normal thing, you know, uh, banquets and so forth. This is something that we should be having ourselves. We should be having banquets, right? We should be having banquets, even if it's virtual banquet, but not really. But like we should be getting together, eating food, you know. Like how many times have have I been at your dinner table? Not your dinner table, but how, but that's that's a, like like that's the thing I noticed when I was looking back at the civil rights movement in America, right? They used to send out invitations, right? Like, like I say, the NWCP would send out invitations, but they, they invite you into their home, you know? And you would sit down with somebody in your home, and y'all would eat some good food or whatever, and y'all talk politics, you know? That's what you're supposed to be doing. And you see how he says the guilds and the crafts people, like, like this is the stuff, like, and rewarding the arts and... And, 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 and making sure that everybody is not getting their stuff confiscated, but, you know, having incentive and inventive and all that stuff. Like, this is what it's about. This is what people are living for. This is what people want. You know, they want to be able to sit down, like, 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 they want to be able to sit down and enjoy their life and enjoy their trade while somebody intelligent is out there and they're courteous, but they out there, you know, doing the war for them. You know what I mean? That's what you want, man. You know, that's what you want. You know, that's something that, like, that's that's deep, you know? All right. Anyway, let's go. Chapter 22, the Minister of Princes. Uh, Machiavelli's title for this chapter has secretaries, not ministers. The sole occurrence of secretary in the work, in this way, ministro, covered high-level uh, servants generally. But later in this chapter, we'll see Machiavelli thinking mainly of prime ministers. So uh, a prince's choice of minister is important to him. And it's up to him, to his intelligent foresight, whether he has good ones. The first opinion that one forms, and I actually I want I want to point out this though, because there is another video game, I think it's called Crusader Kings, right? And that's what, like it's all it's all of this, 
like I tell you, white people like have like I could name three games on top of my head, right? Where because my because I take my brother was into that stuff, you know. He was try he always tries to put that stuff onto me, and he's like, oh, I think you like this. I think you like this. So you know, and of course that's my older brother. So I know how I don't know if y'all know I I don't know if y'all know how y'all know y'all family dynamics, but uh, like when you have older brothers, like you kind of like. Like, when they tell you to do something... Well, not when they tell... I mean, it's weird, but, like... <laughs> one of my brothers really thinks that I was, like, it's straight up. Like, he was like, if I tell you anything, you just do it. And I was like, I guess, you know? But, like, not really. Like, I kind of consciously started making a choice against that. Because it's not like he telling me to, like, eat dirt or nothing. He's just like, hey, can you... Well, I mean, eventually he started being a little disrespectful with it. But, you know, usually he'd be like, hey, can you pass me that cup? I'd be like, sure, obviously. There's nothing wrong with me passing a cup that's right next to me. But eventually he was like, yo, pick up that cup. I was just like, what the, f-? <laughs> like, what? I, mean, I still, you know, but like, even so, but it's like, but what I'm saying is that, you know, your brothers are like, hey, look into this game, so I would look into a game, you know what I mean? Or sometimes they'd be like, hey, look into this, 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 this show or this cartoon or whatever, and I, I would look into it. And I would do the same thing with my younger brothers, you know what I mean? Like, I, I might go to my older brothers and be like, hey, look into this, look into that. They're like, nah, I'm not interested. Nah, I ain't, you know what I mean? That's cool. But like that's just like it's just like a brother dynamic. So my brothers are kind of like nerds, if you will. So I might have a little bit of nerd habits from them. You know, not like everything they do, but if if you're wondering why I know so many games, it's because my brothers were gamers. You know what I mean? So anyway, so anyway, uh, Prince's choice of ministers is important to him, and it's up to him to his intelligent foresight whether he has good ones. The first opinion that one forms of a kid, prince's intelligence comes from observing the men he has around him. When they are competent and loyal, he should be regarded as shrewd because he is known how to spot competence in people and to keep them loyal. But when they are otherwise mediocre or disloyal, one can have a good opinion of him because his choice of ministers was his first big mistake. Anyone who knows Antonio da Venafro in his role as a minister of Pandolfo Petrucci, Prince of Siena, would regard uh, Pandolfo as a clever, very clever man to have such a minister. Now, I want to point to this because I was in the... I was in the... Uh, I was in the UAM, United African Movement. The chairman of that is Alton Maddox Jr., the attorney at war. Great man. Okay? But at some point he was like, but I was with the elder. Like, I had an elder with me in that organization. And she was like, she, she, like she, would, she would say, like, essentially, Alton Maddox would tell us that he would, if, if there was a rat who was loyal to him, he would work with that rat. And it's like, no, you've you, you got to surround yourself with good people. You know, that, that's one of the problems that I had, too, because, like I said, I used to be organizing, and I would have, I would kind of surround myself with, like, anybody, because I really wasn't paying attention to the people around me. Like, like, a lot of times, I'm just like, like, my focus is Africa. My focus is on how can we, how can we accomplish, so it's like, if people are around me doing some stupid shit or whatever, I'm just like, okay, calm down, right? But, but like, I'm just like, I'm not, I don't care. Like, like, like I, was, I just need to, you know, focus on Africa. But all the same, like, that's a problem with me, too. But, like, when it came to the chairman, like, he had this, he had this rat-like dude as the, as the door guard, you know? And it's like, I get it, because, like, not too many other people want to be the door guard or whatever. But, like, that's the stuff. And, like, what made me actually leave the UAE, I'm going to admit it, was that when we were doing the Freedom Party, he selected this Charles Barron character to be the uh, gubernatorial candidate. And then at the end of the... At the end of all this campaigning, right, where we put all we put all we had into getting black people a political party, independent black political party, he betrayed us. Uh, Altamatics, oh no no sorry, uh, Charles Barron betrayed us, and Altamatics was like, yeah, I knew he was no good, but uh, you know I didn't think he was that bad, you know. But it was just like, if you knew he was no good, why did you have us? Why did you plead on his behalf? You understand? And, like, it just hurt me because it was like I really put all I had into that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's like that's, that's that's you know, you can't surround yourself. Like, you have to have good people around you, okay? You have to have good people around you. So it's like if you want me as a minister, that makes sense. But if you're going to have, like, a lot of my enemies as ministers, then something's wrong with you. And that's that's why, like I said, there was a conflict. that Not a conflict, but there were some people that were coming at me. Uh, sibling signing story. <laughs> all right. Uh, sibling son is story, right? Yo, I got son, boy. I got son by my own brother. That don't make no damn sense, right? Like, I mean, my father makes a little sense of my brother, not. Alright, but, but, what, what, what happened with, uh, you know, like, what happened online was that these people was like, 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 when I found out there was one of these brothers was like a grifter, and these other people was like, hey, you know, you guys should, you know, make up. I was like, nah, I'm blocking all y'all for that. Cause it's like, you gotta know, like, like, you can't have two, you, you, like, you can't put me in the same room as 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 Tarina Shee. If you think that me and Tarina Shee should be friends, 
right? You need to get your ass blocked because you ain't even knowing. You don't, you don't have no damn sense on, on who your minister should be. You understand? You have no damn sense on who your minister should be. You, you understand? Come on. Like, like if, there, if there's people openly grifting, don't, like, you need to disengage and, and, and you need to treat them as the Ascari they are. You can't put the Ascari and the Ankobi in the same damn room. You out of your African mind. All right? But anyway, so there are three types of intellect. The superb intellect, which understands things unaided. A good intellect, which understands things when others explain them. And a useless intellect, which doesn't understand anything, even with help. Right? So if Pandalo intellect wasn't of type 1, therefore it was of type 2. Someone with enough judgment to evaluate what others say and do, even if he isn't capable of originality, can can tell when a minister is performing well and when he isn't, and can praise in one case and scold in another, so the minister can't help hope to deceive him and is kept honest. A prince has one infallible test of his quality of a minister. When you see the minister thinking more for himself than for you, keeping an eye on his own advantage in everything he does, he'll never be a good minister and you'll never be able to trust him. Someone who has another person's state, his government in his hands, ought to think never of himself, but always of his prince, spending no time on anything in which the prince is not concerned. On the other hand, to keep his minister honest, the prince should think about his welfare, honor him, enrich him, do him kindness, confer honors and offices on him, executive responsibilities, ministries that will feed his desire for power and influence. And at the same time, the prince should let the minister see that he can't survive without the prince. He should be so rich and so favored that he won't want more of either and has so many offices that he'll be afraid of any change of regime. See what I'm saying? You want to feel needed. You know, you, you have to be needed. You have to be necessary. That's one of the goals. And I'm talking about you as a nation builder. You have to feel necessary. This is partly what we are doing when we talk about organizing, right? When we talk about doing this new organization, we're talking about we need to, like, that's how, that's probably what I need to work into the language of this pamphlet. So so I want y'all to look at the pamphlet, you know, you know, if, 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 if you have access to look at it. I want you to look at it and say to yourself, does this feel like, does it feel necessary? Because, I, I, like, like, that's one of the angles that I should be rushing into this whole thing with. Because that's what people need to see. They need to see that it's necessary to organize for Pan-African power. That's the new term I'm using. Pan-African power. We need to see that it's necessary to organize for Pan-African power. Because otherwise it's not going to be done. All right? So how to avoid flatterers. So I don't want to leave undiscussed an important matter. An error that is hard for a prince not to fall into unless he is very shrewd or very good at selecting men to serve him. I'm talking about flatterers. Princes, courts. And see, I, I'll tell you this right now. Because some of you will be like, oh, man, Oni, you're, you're, you're actually a Democratic shill. No, I, just, I just knew that Trump was no, no good. Okay? But the Democrats destroyed the Freedom Party. Okay, the Democrats are the ones that destroyed the Freedom Party. In fact, Charles Barron was a Democrat. And at the toward the end of it, it was like everybody like it was like it was like we all just figured out it was common sense that if the dude is registered under the Democratic Party, that he wasn't going to look for the success of the Freedom Party. It was just common sense. You understand? It was just common sense that if he is a Democrat, why would he want the Freedom Party? Even though he was talking about it, even though he was on it. Even though he was the gubernatorial candidate, he always had a job as a councilman. He didn't even want to be governor. Really. And the thing is that he wasn't even sort like like we knew he wasn't gonna win the governorship. We just wanted a political party. But why would he want a political party if he was a registered Democrat? You understand? And and so that's why I say I'm not I'm not a fan of the Democrats because they destroyed the 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 because they, they were actively involved in the destruction of this freedom party okay they didn't want an independent black political party and the reality is that there's no way the black independent black party, political party was going to come about because of the democrats so the dude was a flatterer so i don't know if he's going to talk about that but basically this was something that you know we had to know we didn't know i was young i was like in my young 20s okay i was in my early 20s i didn't really know much about the world you know i just wanted to do stuff for black folk I just wanted to be a servant to the people. That's it. But I, I got took for a ride. You know? I'm still kind of mad about it, but it, it shaped me. It made me into who I am. So I'm not too mad about it. Because I like me. You know, even if even if, they, even if not too many other people like me, I like me. 
but that, that's all right. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want to leave undiscussed an important matter, an error that is hard for a prince not to fall into unless he is very shrewd or very good at selecting men to serve him. I'm talking about flatterers. Princely courts are full of them, and it's hard for a prince to protect himself from the plague that they bring because princes, like men in general, are so pleased with their own doing and so deceived about them. A prince who tries to defend himself against flattery runs the risk of being content. The only way to guard yourself from flattery is to make it known that you aren't offended by being told the truth. But you won't get much respect when you are seen as someone to whom anyone can safely tell the truth. So a wise prince will stare a different course between listening to flatterers and listening to everyone, namely assembling a cabinet of wise men and giving the freedom to tell the truth only to them and only in answer to the questions he has put to them. So that's why I was that's why I was saying in my in my in my in my Discord. You know, I used to tell people, look, you don't understand organization if you don't understand rank. And they were like, what's your rank? Blah blah blah. blah. And and my thing was this: it was like you can't be out here publicly saying a bunch of negative stuff about me on the Discord. Because if, if that's what you're doing, that's, that's the value you're trying to bring. I had to, like, I blocked a whole bunch of people. You know? I blocked a whole bunch of people because it was like, you you have to know, like, if I ain't ask you to shut the front door, because we're trying to build something for our people, and people do not want to see that kind of stuff. It looks stupid. You know? Arikana don't, don't surround herself she and Bori don't surround herself with with, with, with with people talking crap about her. Because she would look stupid if she did that. She brought you up on stage for you to talk crap about her and say, oh, I don't trust you. You ain't this. You ain't that. That would look stupid on her behalf. She knows there's people like that out there. She knows she got critics out there. She don't put them on front street. So you don't come on my freaking Discord. And I'm not really talking to nobody. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. Like I'm just, I'm just, I'm just keeping the language. Right? You don't come out of my Discord and think I'm going to keep you on front street. I ain't going to delete all your stuff. I ain't going to block you. I ain't going to do that just because, you know, just because I, I like the truth. No, it's called, it's called, you got to manage your own image. Because the, cause the mission is bigger than us. The mission is bigger than whatever is satisfying you and your ego to come after me. You understand? Like, you like, oh, I just want to be heard. Nobody gives, nobody can't, nobody wants, I don't want to be heard. I want Africa free. That's what I want. You understand? Know like, what do you want? That's all my question. What do you want? Do you want to be heard or do you want Africa to be free? Because if you want Africa to be free, then you come and you, you, you follow the, 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 uh, the, the program. Okay? Or make your own program. But don't come in on my program and expect me to do something for you. Or expect to, you know, bounce off ideas. Like, that, that ain't that ain't happening. That ain't happening. You know what I mean? I, I, don't, I don't wake up in the morning for you. I wake up in the morning for Africa. You know what I'm saying? Not one individual, but for the whole collective. All right? And, 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 and that, 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 that's what it is. You understand? <laughs> he said, I'd be missing stuff on Discord this scene. You already know, man. I'll I, I be, I be making sure people miss that stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I be making sure people miss that stuff. I tell you that one time, man, somebody came to me and they were like, oh, they were like, oh, oh, you, you arrogant and you this and you that and you this that. And I was like, oh, that's good. You don't, you won't find that message anywhere. <laughs> you won't find that message anywhere. You already know. All right, but he should question them about everything. Listen to their opinion and then form his own conclusion. When dealing with these advisors as a group or separately, the prince should implicitly convey to each of them the message. The more open you speak to me, the better I will like it. He shouldn't listen to anyone else, but should resolutely stand by and act on the decisions he has made. If he doesn't have this policy, either he'll be ruined by flatterers or will change course so often because of the different opinions he listens to that people will lose their respect for him. I want to illustrate this with a contemporary example, Father Luca uh, Ranialdi, in service of Maximilian, the present emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, has said that his employer never consulted anyone, yet never got his own way in anything, and this arose from proceeding in the opposite way to the one I have been advocating. The emperor is a secretive man. He doesn't tell anyone what he is planning. He doesn't ask anyone about it either, but when he starts to carry something into effect, it becomes revealed, and no one his courtiers raise objections, and he changes courses. The result is that he does something on one day and underdoes it and undoes it the next. No one ever understands what he wants or plans to do, and no one can rely on his decisions. A prince, therefore, should always take advice, but only when he wants it. See, that's what I'm saying. People will always give unsolicited advice. And I'd be like, look, I ain't ask you. Like, like sometimes people be like, hey, man, only 
Uh, well, one person was like, "Only oh, can you can uh, let's not organize, let's use this as a vehicle, let's uh, let's invest my money." I uh, you remember, matter of fact, I mean, y'all already, uh, yeah, all right, I'm not even gonna say that one, but you you understand? It's like I didn't ask you what you wanted, okay? When I ask you what you want, answer what I asked you, because that's what I'm saying. Well, I had an elder from from she's in the states, she's she's a uh, she's from the states, okay? I got family from the south, okay? And she was like, look. Because when she used to talk to me, she asked me a question, and I would ask her a question back. I would do dog. And she'd be like, look, when when I ask you a direct question, you give me a direct answer. You understand? And I was like, oh, that's a good policy. You understand? You you don't, you, you know, and not just that. It's like, if I didn't ask you a question, then, then don't. then and, 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 and then, you know, you could volunteer. But if I, but sometimes it'd be like, people be telling me stuff, and I'd be like, okay, I'm not interested right now, right now. Or if you want to say that, you know, say it in private or something like that. Right? They just in public. Yeah, man, but you see, but you know how to do it. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing blah, 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 blah? And I just said, look, man, like, even though I might like these people, even though I like these, because I like African people in general, even though I like these people, I have to block them. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, you don't have access to people so just to just to be critical. Because then sometimes people be like, because they see me do these podcasts, they be like, oh, you critical of, of all these elders. So we're going to be critical to you. That's not how it works. You understand? I'm critical of these people. You know, I, I, it's not how it goes. Because the thing is, sometimes you're all just critical, not even critically thinking with your criticism. You're just critical. And, and, and like, sometimes it doesn't make any sense. You just like, it's like you're just negative. You know, there's a difference between saying, look, you know, these people are not revolutionary. These people are never revolutionary. Versus, you know, just talking, you know, oh, man, you know, I don't like the, I don't like the fact that you, you're like, what? Like, I don't remember this stuff. It's just so insignificant. But but we're going to keep going. Because, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I know I'm just ranting. <laughs> I know I'm just ranting. All right. Uh, but he should constantly ask questions and listen patiently to his answers. Oh, yeah. He should discourage anything, everyone from offering advice uninvited. See, that's what, he should discourage everyone from offering advice uninvited. I already do this. But only when he wants it, not when others want to give it. He should discourage everyone from offering advice uninvited. That's what I be telling people on. They don't They don't pay attention. They don't pay attention. But he should constantly ask questions and listen patiently to the answers. And anytime he learns that the answer is holding back about something, uh, answer, he should let his anger be felt. It is sometimes thought that any prince who conveys an impression of intelligence owes this not to his own ability, but to the good advisors that he has around him. But this is certainly wrong. Here's an infallible rule. A prince who isn't wise himself can't take good advice unless he happens to have put his affairs entirely in the hands of one very prudent man. In this case, things may go well, but not for long, because such an advisor would soon take his state away from him. Right? But if an inexperienced prince gets advice from more than one man, the bits of advice he gets won't form a unity. And he won't... So, an experienced prince gets advice from more than one man, his bits of advice won't form a unity, and he won't know how to pull them together into unity. Uh... Each of the advisors will be thinking of his own interests, and the prince won't know how to control them or even to see what they are up to. And it's not a matter of finding better advisors. Men will always be untrustworthy unless they are forced to be honest. Conclusion, good advice, whenever it comes from, and a product of the prince's wisdom, not vice versa. Right? So, this is chapter 24. It might actually be the last chapter, or maybe not. I don't know. But we, 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 we come to the end. We only have four more pages. You can see, so it's 55 out of 59. So, like, like let's, let's, let's do it. We, we, we go on to the... We, we in the warm-up. All right. A new prince, if he carefully follows the procedures I have been recommending from chapter 12 onward. So he's like, why the pr- prince of really have lost his state? Princes onward uh, will come across as having a principality that is hereditary and long established. And this will quickly make his government secure and stable. More so, indeed, than if he had been a prince for a long time because the new prince's actions are watched more closely than those of a hereditary prince. And when they are seen to be the virtuosity, they win more men over and get them more committed than an old princely bloodline can do. Why would that be so? Well, men care more about the present than about the past. And when they like the way things are at present, they will enjoy it and don't look any further. Indeed, they'll do everything they can to defend the prince unless, under whom the present is satisfactory. See, people like the present more than the past. You there, oh, you enslaved me. You enslaved me for, for, for 400 years. Blah, blah. Nobody, like, they don't care. It's about what's going on now. You understand? You know, it's like it's like if police brutality is an issue right now, they're not they they like they might care about that. But if you like, well, you know, y'all been police, you know, y'all these it's like we're not even there right now. You know what I mean? 
Because we enjoying our situation right now. We just don't want to see this stuff happen. Okay? That's how they think. All right? Just, just an FYI. So let me just go back to that. So more so indeed if he has been a prince for a long time. All right, let me so well men care more about the present than about the past past. And when they like the way things are at present, they'll enjoy it and don't look any further. Indeed, they'll do everything they can to defend a prince under whom the present is satisfactory, as long as he doesn't let them down in other ways. Thus it can be a double glory for him to have established a new principality and adorned and strengthened it with a good law, good arms, good allies, and a good example, just as it would be a double disgrace for someone who comes into a hereditary principle and loses power because of his stupidity. Look at the gentlemen who has lost their state in Italy in our times, the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan, and others, and they have two directs in common. Their military arrangements were poor. I have discussed this at length in chapters 13 to 14. Each of them had his people hostile to him, or had the people friendly but didn't know how to protect himself against the nobles. Any state that is strong enough to hold even army in the field can't be lost if it doesn't have either of those two defects. Machiavelli illustrates this with an example from ancient Greece. Then, so our princes who have... See, that might have been an interesting example, but the guy cut it out. Anyway, so our princes who have lost their principalities after many years of possession shouldn't blame their loss on Fortuna. Their real culprit is their own indolence, going through quiet times with no thought of the possibility of change. It's a common human fault, failing to prepare for tempest unless one is actually in one, right? It's a, yeah, human fault. Okay, so when eventually bad times did come, they thought of flight rather than self-defense, hoping that the people upset by the conqueror's insolence would recall them. This course of action may be all right when there's no alternative, but it is not all right to neglect alternatives and choose this one. It, it's almost to voluntarily falling because you think that in due course someone will pick you up. If you do get rescued, and you probably won't, that won't make you secure. The only rescue that is really helpful to you is the one performed by you, the one that depends on yourself and with virtue. So I think that was the penultimate. Maybe this is the last one. Uh, actually, let me just check. Let's just scroll down and see. No, okay, there's two more. So, yeah, so those are the two last ones. So this right here, the one that we're doing right now, chapter 25, is the penultimate i just wanted to use that word penultimate meaning uh before the like the next the, before the ultimate or like the second to last all right so the role of fortune on human affairs and how to withstand it so i'm well aware that many men past and present i have thought about thought that the affairs of the world are governed by fortune and so fortune this is something i want you to, to understand too that that's what a lot of black people in america are, will, are waiting on fortune this idea that fortune is just going to come you know oh white man is just going to fall the empire is going to collapse and and all that stuff, or the civil war is gonna break out, and then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna somehow get our own independent state. You have to be working on it. And I don't know if Machiavelli's gonna say that, but I'm telling you, instead of waiting for like this dude, we'll do like a lot of these people that say that stuff is just phonies. Because I tell you, look at the look at look at how they live it. You gotta look at how they live it. They're living pretty good. They're not. They don't want to lose all that. They don't want to lose all that. They're not preparing for no trenches. They're not preparing for no war. They don't want to lose none of that. I'm letting you know right now. I'm letting you know right now. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. So we're going back to this. So it says, I'm well aware that past and present I have thought that the affairs of the world are governed by fortune and by gods in which in such a way that the human prudence can't get a grip on them and we have no way of protecting ourselves. There is some evidence that by God, Dadio was inserted into the text after Machiavelli's death. Everything else in this chapter concerns fortune. Okay, so there's some evidence that that was not there. All right. So, you know, people just do whatever they want. All right. So these people hold that we needn't sweat sweat much over things and that we should leave things, everything to chance. He's talking about, he, even though you, you weren't even born, he's talking about the people around you. You know what I'm saying? This opinion has been more widespread in our day because of the huge changes in affairs that we have seen and that are still going on, changes that no one could have predicted. Sometimes when I think about this, I am a little inclined that way myself. However, so is not to put our free will entirely out of your business i contend that fortune that decides half of our actions living the other half or perhaps a bit less to our decisions so i mean of course they're talking about like for instance the moors were uh collapsed the moors are ruling they, they were uh you know successful blah, blah blah and then they just lost they collapsed they started fighting amongst themselves their mercenaries uh turned against them and they just collapsed and that had nothing to do with italy had nothing to do with britain had nothing to do with i had little to do with italy had nothing to do with, you know what i'm saying it just it just happens like the world is moving constantly and things happen okay and, and you could just capitalize all right and of course that's from the wazungu perspective and the same with uh you know in africa in africa you know we were colonized in the different countries and then europe goes to a big war and then europe goes to a second big war right and they're weakened by these wars and then now algeria could stand up uh ghana could stand up then ghana helps out 
uh, Kenya, Kenya. You know what I'm saying? Like, like all this happens. That's, that's fortunate, if you will. But it's really the, the movement of peoples, the movement of human. But now you might be in Kenya and they have nothing to do with you. You know, Germany and, and Britain fighting and then and then Ghana coming through like, yo, I got you. Right? Might have nothing to do with what you're doing in Kenya, but you can take advantage. You know, you don't know how, but it happens. This is the world. The world is moving a lot. Okay? This is just reality. All right. But anyway, I compare Fortuna to one of those raging rivers which, when in flood, overflow the plains, sweep away trees and buildings, pick up soil in one place and dump it elsewhere. Everything tries to escape such a flood. No one can do anything to hold it back. Everyone capitulates to its violence. But despite all that, when the weather turns fair and the river calms down, men can prepare for the next time by building dikes and dams. So the river is next in flood. It will stay within its banks or at least not be so uncontrolled and damaging. That's how it is with Fortuna, which shows its power in places where virtue hasn't made preparations to resist it. It sends its forces in directions where it knows that barriers and defenses having been raised to constrain it. Think about Italy. It is a scene of such changes. It set them in motion and is the metaphorically speaking open countryside with no dams, no dikes. Its proper virtue had been put into building defenses as was done in Germany, Spain and France. This flood of foreign invasions wouldn't have had such severe effects. It might not have happened at all. That's all I need to say in general terms about resistance to Fortuna. But there's one more detailed matter that I want to discuss. We see that a prince can be happy today and ruin tomorrow without any change in himself. I think that this has to be explained mostly through the matter I have been discussing. A prince who relies entirely on Fortuna is lost when it changes. But it may also be due to something else that I shall now present. A prince whose actions fit the spirit of the times will be successful, whereas one whose actions are out of tune with the times will fail. In projects aiming at what everyone aims at, namely glory and riches, it's clear that different men proceed differently. And uh, One proceeds with caution, another impetuously, one by force, another by skill, one prepared to wait things out, another plunging in with no delay, and each type of procedure will lead to success. It's also uh, that these sometimes happen. Of two men who both proceed cautiously, one succeeds and the other fails. One man proceeds cautiously, another impetuously, and they both succeed. This is all a matter of whether a man weighs, man's way of proceeding conforms to the spirit of the times. Rises and falls in people's individual welfare are also affected by this. Consider someone who manages his affairs with caution and patience. If the time and circumstance come together in a way that fits his method, his fortune is made. But if times and circumstance change, he is ruined, unless he changes his whole approach, but no one will do that. There are two reasons... There are two reasons a man might have for refusing to change his course. He can't go against his natural inclinations, or he can't be talked out of behaving in a way that has uh, worked well for him for so long. So the cautious man, when the time comes for plunge ahead, doesn't know how to do it, thus, and thus he is ruined. If he has changed his conduct to fit his time, his fortune would have stayed level. And this is just something in general. It's like, you know, sometimes just change your ways, you know? Pope Julius II did everything impetuously, and the time and circumstances conformed so well that, to that approach that he always succeeded. Uh, consider uh, his first campaign against uh, Bologna when Giovanni Bentivogli was still alive. The Venetians didn't want him to do this, nor did the king of Spain in discussing the enterprise with the French king. But with his accustomed boldness and energy, Julius embarked on his campaign, leading it to leading in person. Spain and the Venetians stood by passively. The Venetians from fear and Spain from a desire to recover the kingdom of Naples and France. Julius drew the uh, French king into the campaign because the king wanted him as an ally in checking the power of the Venetians and now that Julius had made his move or refusal to help him would have been too much a snub. Thus Julius with his impetuous action achieved something that no other pope could have pulled off with all the prudence in the world for if he had stayed in Rome until everything had been agreed and settled as any other pope would have done he would never have succeeded. The king of France would have made a thousand excuses for not helping and the others would have raised a thousand fears of how things might go wrong if he went ahead. Fortuna changes, and men don't change in their ways of going around things. So long as the two agree, men are successful. When they quarrel, men are unsuccessful. I think that it is better to be adventurous than to be cautious, because Fortuna is a woman, and if you want to stay on top of her, you have to slap and thrust. Uh, wow, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a, wow, okay. Uh, that causes <laughs> And it's clear that she is more apt to submit to those who approach her in that way than to those who go about the business coolly. As a woman, she is always more partial to young men because they are less cautious, more aggressive, bolder when they master her. All right, that was uh, okay. That was a little interesting. Uh, uh, don't don't be violent against women. 
You know, let, let's let's no, no domestic abuse. All right, <laughs> all right, let's go. Uh, a plea to uh, liberate Italy from the barbarians. Thinking back over everything I've written up to here, this is the ultimate one. This is the last one. Let's go. Thinking back over everything I've written up to here, I ask myself whether the time is now right for the entry of a new prince and whether Italy now contains materials that a wise and virtuoso prince could shape into a new order of things that would bring honor to him and good to the people of his country. My answer is yes. So many things are coming together to favor a new prince, it seems to me, but I can't think of any more time more fit than the present. I have said that the virtue of Moses should, couldn't have been shown if the people of Israel hadn't been in captivity, and that Cyrus's greatness of soul couldn't have been revealed uh, to, if the Persians had been, been oppressed by the Medes, and that if the fine abilities of Theseus couldn't have been put to work if the Athenians hadn't been scattered. If that is all correct, then the great virtue of a great Italian spirit couldn't be shown until Italy reached rock bottom, as it is now done. More enslaved than the Hebrews, more oppressed than the Persians, more scattered than the Athenians, with no leader, no government, beaten, robbed, lacerated, overrun, enduring every kind of desolation. Scholars agree that the topic of this next remark is Cesare Borgia. No longer, not long ago, there was someone who showed a spark of greatness that might have made one think God had ordained him to rescue Italy, but at the height of his career, it was clear that fortune had turned against him so that Italy, half dead, is still waiting for someone to heal its wound and put an end to the la ravaging of Lombardy and to the extortionate taxing of the kingdom of Naples and of Tuscany, cleansing the sores that have festered so long. It's clear that Italy is begging God to send someone who will deliver it from this cruel little treatment of the hands of foreigners. It's also clear that Italy is ready and willing to march behind the flag if only someone will raise one. The rest of this chapter can be seen as addressed to the person to whom the prince was dedicated, uh, see page one, and through him to the Medici family in general, read the prince of the church, the dedicates unto Giovanni de Medici was elected Pope in 1513 while Machiavelli was writing The Prince. Uh, the only hope for Italy that anyone can see right now lies in your distinguished family with its fortuna and virtue favored by God and by the church, of which is now the prince. It could be leader in the rescuing of Italy. That won't be hard to do, as you will realize if you bring back to mind the actions and lives of the men I have named, Moses, Cyrus, and Theseus. They were indeed great and wonderful men, but still they were only men. And none of them had any more opportunity than is offered by Italy today. Their undertakings weren't much more just than this or easier than this. And God wasn't more of their friend than he is yours. Our cause is utterly just because wars are just when they are necessary and arms are sacred when they are your only hope. Uh, quoted from the Latin historian Livy. The, uh, look at that. Look at this. This is white people, man. White people say arms are sacred and war is just. Okay. Uh, the circumstances are utterly favorable, and when that's the case, the difficulties can't be great if you're, you'll only follow the three men I have presented as models. Furthermore, uh, G has given us extraordinary, indeed unprecedented signs. The sea has divided, a cloud has led the way, water has gushed from a rock, mana has rained down, events have come together to contribute to your greatness. It's for you to do the rest. Uh, G doesn't like doing everything, depriving us of our free will and our share in the glory. The signs are from Exodus 13.7. It's not clear what actual events in Italy they are a metaphor for. Uh, okay. Hold on a second. Let's see. Is there any comments? No. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you guys have any other comments, because this is the last page, so if you have any other comments, let me know before I used to end. Right? Oh, I'll actually type it. I'll just type it. So if any... All right, so if anyone has any comments or questions, let me know. We're wrapping up. All right, so it's not surprising that none of the Italians I've talked about have been able to do everything that I think your distinguished family can do, or that in all Italy's wars and revolutions that has some seen that military virtue was exhausted, it was because the old way of doing things in government or in war was bad, and no one has been able to devise a new one. For a man who has newly risen to the top, nothing brings him more honor than devising new laws and new practices. When such things are solid and show vision, they'll bring him respect and admiration, and in Italy there's no shortage of matter waiting to be given form. Here in Italy there's great virtue in the limbs, but it's missing from the head. Individual soldiers are fine, but the military leadership is not. Look attentively at the individual duels and hand-to-hand -hand comments that have been fought, how superior the Italians are in strength, dexterity, and skill, but when it comes to armies there's no comparison, and that's because they are badly led. They really 
the really able officers aren't obeyed and everyone thinks that he knows best and there has never been anyone whose virtue and fortune I have made him stand out so that the others would stand aside and let him lead. That's why it is that for so long and so much fighting in the past 20 years, no holy Italian army has done well as witnesses who happened at second, at Il Taro, then Alexandria, uh, Capua, Genoa, Valia, Bologna, and Mestri. Uh, so as your illustrious family wants to follow those remarkable men who come to the rescue of their country, the main thing you have to do is the foundation of everything else is to provide yourself with your own army because no mercenary foreign auxiliary can be possibly be more loyal, more reliable, better soldiers than your own citizen soldiers will be. Look at that. If we want to do something about the state of affair in Africa, first things first, the foundation of everything else is to have your own army. Okay? Have your own army. All right? So, and that's what I said about rank. You know, like I said, you know, because somebody was like, hey, what do you mean by, uh, when you say, when I say know your rank, because somebody was talking kind of about me, and I was like, know your rank. He's like, what's your rank? Did you say you have a better rank than me? I'm like, no, you ain't got no fucking army. So you talking stuff to me don't make no damn sense. You telling me to do something don't make no sense because we're not even in the same army. There's no rank. We have to think about building armies. That's what we have to think about. And everything else you're talking don't make no damn sense. It's in the freaking header of my website. It says, an African war without an African army is an African genocide. You're in a genocide because you ain't got no army. And when you have an army, you got to know your rank. If I'm the captain and you're the soldier, then learn your place. And if, and if, and if, and if I'm the captain and you're the general, then I learn my place. You understand? But if, but, if, but if neither of us are soldiers, neither of us are captains, neither of us are generals, then what, why are you even talking to me? You're wasting my damn time. Let's go do this army stuff. So, and, and good as each individual citizen and soldier will be taken together as a unit, they will be even better when they find that they are commanded, paid, and honored by their prince. That's the sort of army you must have if foreigners are to be beaten back by Italian virtue. Machiavelli now has the longest passage discussing specific weaknesses of the Spanish and French Swiss infantries. So this is actually pretty, this will probably be interesting, but it's like, like, like the dude cuts it out because it is freaking irrelevant. Who cares about how strong the Spanish and Swiss infantries are in 2020, right? Who cares about how strong they were 600 years ago? So if you were if you into that historical stuff, go read the book, but otherwise, I don't give a shit, you know? Sketching historical evidence for what he says about these and suggesting how an Italian army could be strengthened through an intelligent use of the knowledge about two of its potential enemies, Passage ends thus. The introduction of by a new prince of such new military procedures will increase his prestige and power. This opportunity for Italy at last to have its liberators ought not to be missed. I don't have words to express. The love that would uh, go out to him from all the provinces that have been washed out by foreign flood. The thirst for revenge, the stubborn faith, the devotion, the tears. What doors would be closed to such a man? Who would refuse to obey him? What envy would hinder him? What Italian would deny him homage? This occupation by barbarians stinks in all our nostrils. So many, so may your distinguished family undertake this mission with the courage and hope that go with all just enterprises so that under your standard our country may be ennobled. Uh, and under your auspices, what Petrarch wrote may turn out to be true. Valor will take up arms against wild attacks, and the battle will be short, for ancient valor is still strong in Italian hearts. All right. And let's see. So, so a bit of medicine asks, is there an analogous uh, African book? He said, I just read a paper that states education is only second to war. Yeah, I, read, I heard that. I heard that. He was like, uh, he was like warfare is, uh, uh, education is only second to warfare. You understand? Warfare is the most important thing. And education is second. You know? And he said, is there an analogous book? I, I would say that's uh, Kwame Nkrumah's uh, handbook on African revo uh, revolutionary African warfare. Uh, on revolutionary warfare. You know? Uh, that's why I would say that's one of the required readings for African people. For Ancovia. Like, when we do this organization, I'm 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 going I'm to I'm I'm emphasize how required that book right there is, is for, for people who are really studying to be in the leadership of African people, that you read that book. Okay, because I was going to write my own Art of War. Because Machiavelli also writes Art of War. Sun Tzu writes Art of War. Uh, uh, Clausewitz writes about warfare too. And I was like, I should do the same thing. But I said to myself, wait, Nkrumah just wrote a good manual on, on, on doing war. 
that's actually something that I, mean, I, I don't need to. I don't need to write one. Our people already got one. Okay. I don't need to write one. Our people already got one. But but yeah, I would say that. Uh, oh, otherwise, if you wanted like advice thing, uh, that's another book that I also say is required is Patajo Tep, as well as obviously uh, Marcus Garvey's Message to the People. You know, Message to the People is about the conduct of things. Well, he doesn't really talk about war. Patajo Tep is not really talking about war either. So Nkrumah would would do the same thing. But uh, of course, you know, I, I outlined this. And encourage this in uh, the book of power. You know, just gotta put my own name out there. You already know. But all right, man. Otherwise, you know, those, those are the three books that I would. I mean, those are the four books I would recommend. Uh, you know, and three of them are already on the list. You know, like I said, in the book of power, we have a list of the books that are on the reading list for the Ancobia, and that's it. You know, but but otherwise, yeah, that's that's what it is. So this was a good book. This was a manual. This was the blueprint for white colonialism. You could kind of see it. You know, I kind of jumped away from that for a little bit, but you can kind of see how white folk were trying to manage new states. Because they studied this afterward. They studied this afterward and tried to arrange their behavior. They weren't necessarily doing it before him, but, but they studied this afterward and they eventually did, you know, conquer the rest of the world, you know? So, you know, sometimes you can even just call them Machiavellians if you want. But, but uh, you know, it is what it is. But thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I see more people came on. More people jumped on. I like that. I got more likes. I like that too. Uh, hopefully you guys can listen to the playback because I know a lot of people missed out on a lot. But, you know, it was, it was kind of long, but it's all good. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. I, I, I liked the fact that I could engage with y'all. I liked spending time. I liked uh, doing this. And, and, and we'll talk again, you know, on the next podcast. But thank you so much. Shemian Hotep and, and Asante Sana.